Hi friends, here in this video, I will be explaining the design of EOT crane. So, let's get started. Now, here is the question. It is given, design a snatch block for class 2 crane to lift up a load of 12 tons with a hoisting speed of 10 meter per minute. Next, also if the height up to which the load is to be lifted is 10 meter, then design the rope drum the rope drum shaft select its bearing motor and comment on the transmission so this is the complete design in front of us and when we talk about eot crane it is called as the electrically operated overhead transmission crane and how it looks like first i'll explain the eot crane and then we can go on for the design part so here is the diagram of that eot crane as we can see it consists of the motor and drum arrangement which is there at the top now this motor or drum arrangement is the traversing mechanism that is it will be giving the power through ropes to this part which is called as the snatch block and the rope would be driving or passing through the rope sheaf which is there inside this snatch block and there is a hook at the end to which the load is attached the trolley frame as we can see here it will be traveling on this girder these elements they are called as the girder and in order to drive the girders also we have motor arrangement as it is given here in order to drive the girder there is motor arrangement provided next at the same time we can see that the crane would be operated electrically with the help of this remote control which is provided over here and when we see the complete design here the parts which we have to design those are first we have to design this snatch block snatch block needs to be designed then we have to design this complete rope drum part which is the traversing mechanism which consists of the rope drum, the rope drum shaft and the motor, the gearbox which would be providing power to this drum shaft and finally through it the power would be transmitted with the help of ropes through the rope sheaf and then the load gets lifted. When we are going to see the rope drum, that rope drum would be having the rope wounded both we can say in the clockwise and in the anti-clockwise direction so that is the description regarding the EOT crane and here to the hook the load would be attached which can be in terms of tons and here in the question when we see it is given that we have to lift a load of 12 tons as mentioned over here and the hoisting speed is 10 meter per minute that is the load is to be lifted up by a speed of 10 meter per minute so that is the linear velocity by which it has to be lifted and for this mechanism we have to design the complete snatch block and in the second part of the question they have said that if we want to lift the load up to a height of 10 meter so if it is to be lifted up for 10 meter then we have to design the rope drum the rope drum shaft select the bearing motor and comment on the transmission so we have to design the complete traversing mechanism that is the second part of the question so broadly when we see this design would be consisting of the design of the snatch block which contains the hook rope sheave ropes etc and at the same time we have to design the traversing mechanism which would consist of the rope drum the rope drum shaft then the rope drum we, uh, we can say bearing at the same time the motor and the gearbox so that is what the design would consist of and after that when we look at the snatch block this is the diagram of the snatch block it means out of the complete EOT mechanism here the snatch block I have separated so snatch block it consists of the hook as we can see here then there is a plate which is there at the bottom after that we can see there is a cover plate over here and then there are rope sheaves so after this so here i'll quickly name the parts so this complete diagram is of the snatch block 
also called as the snatch box and it consists of the hook then there would be plates called as the shackle plate and also there will be a cover plate then this part is called as the cross piece and here there are rope sheaves which are provided because these rope sheaves are the pulley through which the ropes would be passing and we have to design these parts at the same time in the cross piece here at the top we are going to have a bearing that also needs to be designed so that is the description of the snatch block now once the description is completed we can easily design the complete EOT mechanism that is we, we are going to start with the snatch block and then we are going on to the traversing mechanism which consists of the drum, drum shaft etc. So that was a small explanation regarding the EOT crane mechanism. So now just before designing the EOT crane I will explain a small concept regarding the pulley arrangement that is if suppose we have a fixed pulley now here the this pulley is called as a fixed pulley we can see that it has it is being fixed at a particular location now the load is attached to this pulley and we need to lift this load so whatever is the load w which is to be lifted that same amount of effort denoted by P is to be applied over here. So we can see that if we want to raise a load W with the help of the fixed pulley arrangement, we have to pull the rope which is passing over this pulley by an effort P and in this condition the load is equal to the effort. So now since mechanical advantage is given as load upon effort so therefore here I can see that load and effort they are same so therefore the mechanical advantage comes out to be 1 in this case so it means if we want to raise a particular load we have to apply the same amount of effort on the other side of the pulley in order to raise the load now if we have a movable pulley instead of a fixed pulley so if we have a movable pulley as we can see here then if you want to lift a load w in that case since here this being a movable pulley the amount of effort required would reduce that is the effort which is required would be exactly half of the load to be lifted because of the movable pulley arrangement if it is a fixed pulley then the load which is to be lifted that same amount of effort would be applied in order to lift a load but the moment we change it with the movable pulley the effort decreases it becomes half of the load to be lifted and same would be the reaction over here so this this system this is called as a two fall system because here we have two ropes which are attached and now because of the effort being decreased it has been half the effort has been reduced by half so therefore here the mechanical advantage would be load upon effort so therefore effort has been reduced it has become w by 2 so after cancellation now this 2 will go into the numerator so we can see the mechanical advantage has been doubled and by doubling the mechanical advantage we can say that mechanical advantage since it is load upon effort we have reduced the amount of effort required to lift a particular load so that is the mechanical advantage by applying a lesser effort we can lift a more amount of load next similarly 
if we have an arrangement in which there are two movable pulleys and one fixed pulley that i am going to explain it over here and that kind of system would be called as the four fall system Now, here if we place a fixed pulley in between the two movable pulleys, then the amount of effort required it reduces. That is, whatever is the amount of load, the effort becomes one fourth of that by using a four fall system. And when I write the mechanical advantage, mechanical advantage is given by load upon effort. So, load is W, effort is being reduced to P by 4 which we can also say it is w by 4 that is whatever of the amount of load which we want to lift so effort would be just one fourth of that so it becomes w by 4 on cancelling this we get mechanical advantages 4 so it means if the amount of effort reduces the mechanical advantage increases and it means in order to lift a particular load if we have is such a system which is a four fall system in which there are two movable pulleys and one fixed pulley the amount of effort required to lift a particular load reduces considerably so that is the advantage and here the number of falls see these are called as number of falls the number of ropes as we can see here they are passing on this pulley so here we have one fall then second third and fourth fall so it is a four fall system and the number of bends are given by the formula number of falls minus 1 so it is 4 minus 1 the number of bends are 3 number of bends can also be explained in this way like here we have one bend then we have the second bend and the third bend so also calculated by using this formula now similarly if we want to lift a load which is way much higher that is in this problem the amount of load to be lifted is given as 12 tons if the load is even higher then we can go for a 6 fall system and in that 6 fall system we are going to have an arrangement wherein there would be 3 movable pulleys and in between them 2 fixed pulleys so the mechanical advantage would be 6 it means in that case the effort reduces further in order to lift a particular load but such systems are to be used if the amount of load is higher and here we are going for the four fall system and next once we have reached up till here that is the concept has been explained now i can start with the design part as we see in the question it was given we have to design a snatch block for class 2 eot crane so in the data we have class 2 eot crane if nothing is mentioned we have to always assume class 2 then to lift up a load of 12 tons so w is equal to 12 tons converted into kg by multiplying with 1000 with a hoisting speed of hoisting velocity is 10 meter per minute so it has been converted into meter per second by dividing with 60 so the first part of the problem will deal with the design of the snatch block and the second part also if the height up to which the load is to be lifted is 10 meter so the height of lift is given and we have to design the rope drum so the second part of the problem will talk about the design of the rope drum so once the data has been understood we can start with the solution part and in that the first step is the step number one is design of snatch block and in that see remember that snatch block in itself consists of many parts as explained in the description as well the snatch block consists of the rope sheave then there would be ropes the shackle plate and cover plate there would be cross piece and this hook so snatch block entirely consists of many parts so it means step number one will have many sub steps so starting with the first sub step that is selection of the wire rope and in the selection of the wire rope we have two available options and the available options are 
cross leg and parallel leg now what are the meaning of cross leg and parallel leg that i'll explain now this diagram which i have drawn it is not an exact standard diagram but to understand the concept of cross lay and parallel lay it is sufficient so what i have done here is here when we see this outer circle which is in black that is called as strand so we have the strand of rope then whatever is there inside these wires which we are seeing in red these are called as fine wires so how a rope is made we have number of fine wires and if those fine wires are twisted and i am taking an example that if all these fine wires they are twisted in a clockwise manner just for an example now if the fine wires are twisted in a clockwise manner to form one strand and all those strands are taken together and they are also rotated or twisted in a clockwise direction to form a rope clockwise direction means they can even have the same direction that is the meaning of parallel lay because in that the fine wires and the strands are twisted in the same direction to form the rope and in case of cross lay if suppose the fine wires are twisted in a clockwise manner but the number of strands which are formed they are twisted in an anti clockwise manner so that kind of rope is called as a cross lay rope so again if we want to just understand this the fine wires when they are connected to form a strand and rotated or twisted in a clockwise direction then the number of strands connected they are also twisted in the same direction it becomes parallel lay and if the fine wires and the strands they are twisted in an opposite sense that is called as the cross lay so these are the available options and once the strands are connected or twisted the rope looks like this here i have shown in this diagram we can see that this single part this is called as one strand consisting of number of fine wires and then each of the strands when they are connected and twisted we get this metallic rope so that was the explanation regarding the cross lay and the parallel lay and now out of these options we have to always go for the cross lay and the justification i'll give it over here so therefore selecting cross lay the first justification is that so the first is it does not have a tendency to rotate when the load is being lifted it means the rope will not rotate in case of the cross lay compared to the parallel lay the second justification is it is easy to handle while operating and third is it does not hink by hink we mean that it does not entangle since your ropes are involved the ropes should not get entangled while lifting a particular load so these are the advantages that is why we are preferring the cross lay connection or the cross lay rope now the standard designation for cross lay are given by ropes are designated in a standard form those are 6 into 9 then 6 into 19 and 6 into 37 so therefore selecting 6 into 37 and 6 by 6 into 37 we mean that 6 indicates the number of strands whereas 37 indicates number of fine wires so it means these fine wires which we are seeing in red so for a 6 into 37 configuration 
there would be 37 fine wires and we are going to have 6 strands consisting of 37 fine wires each so that is the standard and why we have selected it the justification is since more fine wires therefore more flexibility so hence we are preferring 6 into 37 configuration now after selecting the row the next part is we are going to have or going to calculate the tensile load per fall it means since I had explained previously that we are going to use a four fall system here so we have to find out how much is the load which is carried on the per fall that is one fall is carrying how much amount of load so for that here is the formula that since the tensile load per fall is given by F is equal to so the formula is the tensile load per fall denoted by capital F is equal to total load on the ropes upon the number of falls into efficiency of pulley now for number of falls it should be 4 for the capacity of less than 25 tons so it means if the load which we want to lift if it is less than 25 tons then we have to always go for the 4 fall system and if the load is greater than 25 tons we can go for 6 fall system now the efficiency of the pulley is taken as 0 0.95 and that is to overcome the frictional losses next the total load on the ropes would be now as we can see here in the diagram the ropes which are attached they are going to carry the weight of the snatch block as well as the load which is attached on the hook so rope contains or it carries both the loads so therefore the total load would be load on hook plus weight of snatch block so therefore putting the values the load on the hook it is 12 tons so it is 12 into 10 raised to 3 kg plus the weight of the snatch block can be taken as 5% of the total load which is there on the hook so therefore 5% means it is 0 0.05 of the load which is carried by the hook which is 12 into 10 raised to 3 kg divided by 4 falls into the efficiency which is 0 0.95 so on calculating this I am going to get the answer that is the load which is carried tensile load per fall and the answer comes out to be it is 3315 kgf so this much is the load which is acting on one fall now the next sub part is after we have calculated the tensile load per fall and we have also determined which kind of rope we are using now we have to select the rope diameter so the next step is selection of the rope diameter in that I'll write down let us first calculate the breaking strength required for the rope and for that we can refer PSG 9.1 now on PSG 9.1 at the top it is written wire ropes in that we have to select for 6 into 37 group of ropes because that is the designation we have selected 
so here we have the breaking strength formula given by f into sigma u upon sigma u divided by small n minus small d by capital D minimum into 36,000 where small n is called as the stress factor or design factor taken as n dash into duty factor then f we know it is the load acting per fall then sigma u is the tensile strength of the wire and the value we have to take it as 18,000 kgf per centimeter square and that is taken from the reference that is from the book Rudenko so for from there we can get this value and now for the duty factor which we are going to require here for that I will explain duty factor is there on PSG 9.2 that is the next page here we have duty factor in life of mechanism in that we have to see the class it is class 2 duty factor depends on strength so we have to take the strength and the duty factor comes out to be 1.2 so I will explain it that in this formula F value we have it is 3315 kgf next sigma suffix u value should be taken as 18000 kgf per centimeter square and this comes from Rudenko book then small n is made up of n dash into duty factor and n dash value is there from PSG 9.1 here it is written factor of safety n dash and class of the class of the crane is given we have to select class 2 because it is given in the problem and on the left side the rope application is given so the rope application is we are into this cranes and hoists in general hoist blocks so for that in class 2 the value of n dash is 5 so n dash comes out to be 5 and the duty factor is 1.2 duty factor is based on strength this is from PSG 9.2 as explained and whatever formula we have written here it is for the designation of rope 6 into 37 then after reaching up to here we are left with small d by d minimum we have to select this and for that small d by d minimum I will explain it over here it is from PSG 9.1 and in that we have two options first is from PSG 9.1 here the ratio of drum diameter to the rope diameter is given and we have to select for the cranes and hoists for the cranes and hoists 6 into 37 and class 2 the value is 17 so the first option is 17 next on that same page capital D min pi small d that is the ratio of the drum diameter versus the rope diameter is given and now it, this depends on the number of bends and as explained in this problem that it is a fourfold system so it has three bends and the ratio of d min by small d is 23 for three bends so therefore the next option is 23 now out of this we have to always select the higher value because this ratio is indicating capital d min by small d and when we are talking about capital D min it is the drum diameter and now the bending stress is always inversely proportional to the drum diameter that is also we can say area so if the diameter goes on increasing the bending stress goes on reducing and if there is less chances of bending then the life is of the system is inversely proportional to the bending stress that is if sigma b goes on reducing then the life life of the rope or we can say the complete system goes on increasing so that is why we have to select the higher value so now 
since capital D min by small d is 23, here it is reciprocal, so this would be 1 upon 23. So as we see here, we have all the values, after putting all these values, the answer of P comes out to be, it is 41.598 into 10 raised to 3 kgf and dividing this by 10 raised to 3 will give me the answer in tons so that becomes 41.6 tons so that is the breaking strength required for the rope now it also says that our application is only up to 12 tons but the rope will break when the load reaches a value of 41.6 tons and since we won't be overloading the crane that is we don't we are not going to use it for a value greater than 12 tons so it means the rope would be safe and now therefore the next step would be to determine the diameter of the rope so from PSG 9.4 on PSG 9.4 at the top it is given wire ropes for general engineering purposes and this is for group 6 into 37 that is what we have selected in the first column we have the rope diameter and here we have the nominal breaking strength of rope which is in tons breaking strength just now we have found out and we have to go for the tensile strength of wire between 175 to 190 kgf per mm square and the value is 41.6 so i'll go on saying that value now we don't have a value of 41.6 but the next higher value is 44.7 so select that value and corresponding to it the rope diameter comes out to be 29 mm so this is what we are going to select so therefore Selecting the diameter of rope as 29 mm for which the breaking strength is P is equal to 44.7 tons which is greater than the 41.6 tons which we had calculated. So it means the rope would be safe. Now the next sub step would be after determining of the rope. We are going to analyze the life of the rope wire. So next part is checking the life of wire rope. Now in this we have two cases. First one expected life will be given. Let us say that the expected life is 10 months or next is the expected life is not given so in that case we are going to find the expected life of the wire rope now in this this question nothing is specified about the expected life so i'll be explaining both the steps and remember in exam we have to just follow any one of the case that is no need to do both the cases here i am showing both the cases but in exam out of these we have to go for any one, any one case in exam. So now I will explain the first case which is the life of the rope is 10 months. So will it be safe or not? Now for this, since from PSG 9.7, from PSG 9.7, here we have the formula capital N is equal to 0 0.4 Z upon A beta Z2 where capital N is the rope life in months of 25 days. So therefore now how to get these values for that I am keeping this as equation 1 Z we will calculate later first the values which we can get directly starting with small a so a beta and z2 value all three values can be taken from 
PSG 9.8. So the value of A is from PSG 9.8. Here we have table number two in which we have A, Z2, and beta. So PSG 9.8 table number two. A value is equal to now this Z2 is indicating the number of repeated bends per cycle since we have three bends so Z2 value is 3 corresponding to it the working cycles per month that is small a is 3400 beta is the endurance factor which is 0 0.4 and there is the medium duty of 16 hours per day for this mechanism or for this complete EOT crane so that is what we are getting from here I will write down the values A is equal to 3400 beta the endurance factor 0 0.4 Z2 value is 3 now to calculate Z to get Z first the life is equal to 10 months so it means that is nothing but capital N so when I am putting the values in equation 1 I am going to get the answer of Z so therefore put all values in first equation so n is equal to 10 so on calculating this the answer of z comes out to be it is 102 into 10 raised to 3 now after getting z value I will be calculating from PSG 9.8 I'll be calculating M by interpolation because this M value would be required in the formula where we are going to get capital D so small m just when we have calculated Z we are going for small m which is again a factor so from PSG 9.8 at the top we have value of factor M now z as we see the values are given we have to see z is is in terms of thousands means multiplied by 10 raised to 3 so here we have 30 into 10 raised to 3 50 into 10 raised to 3 and so on whereas small m is in hundreds so it means this m value has been divided by 100 so if the first value is 26 so this value is 26 divided by 100 so it is 0. Point, it is 0. 0.26 similarly all the values of m here are in actual divided by 100 as we can see here now the z value which we have got because as we see there is a relation between z and m so z is 102 into 10 raised to 3 and it lies between 90 and 110 so the value of 102 is in between them and corresponding to it we have to calculate the m value so i would be using the interpolation method here which i'll write it over here that we are calculating m by interpolation and it comes out to be first we have the z value which is 90 into 10 raised to 3 next on the other side of the equal to write the m value which is corresponding to this z value so the m value since z is in terms of 1000 so i have multiplied with 10 raised to 3 m value is 70 so divided by 100 it is 0 0.7 then minus since the value the next is 110 into 10 raised to 3 so as we see here it is 110 and in terms of thousands so 110 into 10 raised to 3 corresponding to it the m value is 83 so it means it is 0 0.83 so minus 0 0.83 then in the denominator same 90 into 10 raised to 3 corresponding to it the m value which is 0 0.7 minus now the z value which we have got 102 10 raised to 3 corresponding to its small m value is what we have to find out so on calculating this i am getting the answer of m and it comes out to be 
जीरो पॉइंट सेवन सेवन एट सो दिस वॉज द इंटरपोलेशन मेथड बाई विच वी गेट स्मॉल एम नाउ वेर इट वुड बी यूज आई राइट अ फॉर्मूला दैट सिंस फ्रॉम पी एस जी नाइन पॉइंट सेवन वी कैन सी दैट देर इज अ फॉर्मूला ऑफ कैपिटल डी बाई स्मॉल डी इज इक्वल टू एम इंटू सिग्मा सी वन सी टू इंटू सी प्लस एट so here is where we are going to see the small m value that is why i had calculated it so capital d as we see it is the drum or the pulley diameter to which the rope is connected and d is the rope diameter so therefore now m value is already known to us sigma for sigma we can refer the same psg 9.7 and here they have given the formula it is the tensile stress in the rope given by 10f upon pi d square and the unit would be in the form of kgf per mm square so the formula of sigma is given over here 10f upon pi d square now here f indicates the load acting per fall and f value was 3315 kgf divided by pi the diameter of rope came out to be 29 mm so on calculating this i am getting sigma value as 12.54 small m 0.778 into sigma is 12.54 kgf per mm square then c1 c2 and c now on psg 9.7 c1 we have to refer table 3 so it is just on the next page we have c1 and it depends on the rope diameter which is over and up to 5 mm the c1 value is 0.83 now our diameter of rope is 29 so for that we can see that this is up to 28 mm and next is 30 so for 30 mm that is it is up to 34.5 mm so for that so our value of 29 mm diameter is in between them so we are going to take the average of 1.09 and 1.16 so therefore c1 value comes out to be 1.125 by taking the average next c2 value again on psg 9.7 we have c2 as 0.63 plus 1.15 so taking the average we are going to get c2 it comes out to be 0.89 so therefore C two is zero point eight nine. Next is capital C, and for that we have to refer PSG nine point eight values of factor C. It is given in table number four, and in that we have to go for six into thirty seven. That is the configuration, and for cross and parallel we are going for the cross lay. In that ultimate strength are given as one thirty. 160 and 180 so going for the rope strength of 180 because that is what we have selected in the range for the diameter so it is 1.02 as the value of c so therefore c is 1.02 hence on calculating this i get the ratio as 17.97 so now once i got this ratio previously the ratio which we had <coughs> was 23 so since our ratio of 23 is greater than this value so i can say that therefore our rope will be having more life than expected so therefore it is safe now suppose if for example the ratio would have been greater than 
it means the if the rope would be failing because here we are the first case in which we are doing in that we are checking that if for a particular life the life of the rope is 10 months so if it is going to sustain that life or not that we had calculated by using this parameter if suppose the ratio would have been greater than 23 then in that case the value of the ratio the answer which we, we would have got would be kept in this equation where we had calculated the breaking strength of the rope and we have to calculate the new breaking strength and based upon that we have to select the new wire or the new rope diameter but since here the ratio has come less than the value which we have got so it means it is okay but if it would have been greater then we have to select the next strength and based upon that we have to select the next wire rope diameter now this was case number one where the life was given now suppose case number second if the life is not given now if the life is not given then we have to go in exactly the reverse manner like we had used in case number one we have to go completely reverse and calculate the life of the rope in case number one the life was assumed to be 10 months but if the life is not given we have to find the life of the rope and for that the procedure is that in equation 1 we have the formula that is the life of the rope now in that whatever the values are required the values in the denominator that is a beta and z2 they they won't change they would remain as it is the only change would be in the value of z because that depends upon the diameter ratio and how to get the new z value for that I'll be using this same equation and in this I'm going to calculate the small m value so I'll write the formula again that since from PSG 9.7 now previously in order to check the life of the rope we had used this formula to calculate the diameter ratio but now we will use the same formula to get the value of small m so therefore the diameter ratio should be kept the value which we had that is 23 is equal to small m will remain as it is sigma value came out to be the value of sigma 10f upon pi d square it was 12.54 kgf per mm square so sigma would remain as it is multiplied by c1 c1 is 1.125 multiplied by c2 which is 0 0.89 multiplied by c which is 1.02 and also we have 8 here this 8 is there and so the answer which I have got it is adding the value of 8 so remember to add 8 here now plus 8 so therefore on calculating this I am getting m value as 0 0.0117 or this is in the form of hundreds so in order to look into the table I am getting it as 1.17 that is the m value from this calculation and in order to look into the table so this value is divided by 100 so 1.17 has been divided by 100 because we go into we want to go into that table which is there on psg 9.8 so therefore the value is 0 0.0117 by dividing with 100 and therefore from PSG 9.8 table number 1 again calculation of Z value previously we had calculated M now Z value by interpolation method so M value is from PSG 9.8 at the top we have table 1 
now these factors of m these are divided by 100 so like the way i had done the answer was 1.17 so dividing by 100 because we going, want to go into that table here the value is <coughs> in hundreds so when we take 26 in actual it is 0 0.26 so the value which we have got it is 0 0.117 and it would lie in between these values because here we have 107 so dividing that by 100 so 107 is in between here we are getting the value as 1.07 and next is 1.18 so the value of 1.17 is in between them so we have to calculate the z value and therefore by interpolation first we have 150 into 10 raised to 3 so corresponding to it the value of m is 107 divide this by 100 so it is 1.07 minus next is 170 10 raised to 3 because it is in terms of thousands minus corresponding to it m value is 1.18 since it is 118 so dividing by 100 here again we have 150 into 10 raised to 3 minus so 150 into 10 raised to 3 corresponding value of m minus the value which we require would be called as z previously m was unknown to us now the value of m is 1.17 so here i'll say that just when we had calculated m take this value of 1.17 because already in the formula it has been developed in such a way that we get the value in the form of Hundred, so no need to divide here. I am just cancelling this. There is no need of this division because the formula has been derived in such a way that m we are getting in terms of hundreds. Already it has been divided by hundred, so no need to again divide it by hundred. Remember this step. Now on calculating this, I am getting the answer of z, which is one sixty eight point one six into ten raised to three. And now therefore I am going to put all values in equation 1 to get the life of the rope that is capital N. So hence put all values in equation 1. So we have N is equal to 0 0.4 into Z divided by small a beta Z2. The values are known to us. So hence on calculating this the life comes out to be it is 16.48 months so that is the life of the wire rope and as explained I have explained both the cases first when the life was given as 10 months for an example and in the next case the life was not given so we had calculated the life and in exam we have to do only any one of the case so then after calculating the life of the rope, the next part is to calculate the diameter of the fine wire because already we have the entire rope diameter. So now calculation of the wire diameter, I denote it as D suffix W. So wire diameter can be calculated from the formula of the rope diameter that is since the rope diameter is given by 1.5 into the diameter of wire so this is an empirical formula which we have to remember and from this therefore d indicates small d that is the diameter of the rope D suffix W is the diameter of the wire into the number of strands we have 6 strands and number of fine wires in each strand is 37 because that is the designation so in short here we have the under root sign under root whatever term we have that is the designation of the 
wire rope. So it is 6 into 37 simply. So therefore on calculating this the diameter of wire comes out to be 1.297 mm. So that, that is the diameter of each fine wire and no need to round off this value. So here we have calculated the diameter of the wire. Now next step would be and remember we are already into the first step that is we are still designing the snatch block. The first part is regarding the rope that is over. Now we are going to select the sheath. So in this the next step is selection of standard sheath and for that from PSG 9.10 corresponding to a diameter of rope of 29 mm so on PSG 9.10 here the proportions are given for the sheave grooves and how the rope sheave looks like I will just show it with the help of a diagram now the rope sheave is this portion as we can see here in red inside which or we can say it is simply a pulley which would be rotating and here is the axle shaft which is fixed so the pulley is rotating on this axle shaft and this is called as the rope sheave also we can take a look that this is the these are the rope sheaves so we are designing this part and in actual the rope sheave looks something like this through which the ropes would be passing so now we can understand what is the rope sheave so from PSG 9.10 corresponding to wire rope diameter the diameter which we have it is 29 mm so after 28 this diameter is 34.5 so it is up to 34.5 and previously it is up to 28 mm so we are getting the diameter as 29 it is in this range so we will select this wire rope diameter this is up to 34.5 and not exactly 34.5 so the diameter which we are getting is within this limit so I am selecting this sheaf and corresponding to it the proportions are given like for example what is this dimension A A is given as 90 mm then B is this groove width we can say B 70 mm then we have C which is 15 mm next we have E is this height at the top we can see there is a chamfer so E is 2 mm then small h is the height or we can say this is the depth of the groove which is 55 mm then after that so on we have the other dimensions like the radiuses of the rope sheaf then even the length of the rope sheaf is there so I am going to write all these dimensions so these are the standard dimensions of the sheaf which we had selected now after that I will write down that the length of the hub of the sheaf is given by denoted by L suffix H it is to be taken as 20% more of the dimension A you have to remember this so therefore 20% more means it is 1.2 into A so therefore 1.2 into A value was 90 so therefore the length of hub for the sheaf will be 108 mm now after getting the length of hub the length of hub is basically the portion of the sheaf which is supported in this axle here we see there is an axle so that would indicate the length of the hub so this is exactly the length of the hub L suffix H inside which the axle would be there and here I will show another diagram to explain it that in this view we can see that the length of the hub 
is the portion which is going into the axle or the axle is passing through it so this indicates the length of hub l suffix h and now here we have an axle shaft as we can see here this is an axle shaft and why do we provide an axle shaft here because in this case the rope is transmitting the power to this rope sheave the rope is transmitting the power so it means that first the rope sheave would be rotated and this axle shaft is fixed so axle shaft will just help in supporting the rope sheave that is it will avoid the bending and it won't transfer the torque so axle shaft is not your normal transmitting shaft it is just supporting the rope sheave without transmitting any torque so at axle shaft no torque transmission takes place it means it is just used to support the rope sheaves so therefore after reaching up till here i can say that now since the pcd the pitch circle diameter of rope sheave will be calculated from the ratio capital d by small d is 23 so therefore capital d is equal to 23 into small d small d is 29 mm so hence the pcd of the rope sheave comes out to be 667 mm and by PCD of the rope sheave we mean that there would be a circle which would be passing through the center of this rope sheave. So this is the PCD, PCD of rope sheave and inside this we are going to have the rope. So rope diameter is small d, inside this we will have the rope. consisting of number of fire, fine wires so rope diameter is already known to us this would be small d rope diameter and here is the PCD of the sheave which is the capital diameter so from this ratio I am getting the PCD of the rope sheave and it came out to be 667 mm next within this the next step is design of rope sheave excel So the next step within this is we have to design the rope sheaf axle. Rope sheaf has already been designed the dimensions we know. Now we have to design the axle which is passing through this rope sheaf and also select the kind of bearing which we are going to use for the rope sheaf and the axle. And for that here I will explain this diagram. On this diagram on this cut section model here I am having the rope sheave which is mounted on this sheave axle so I have to de define or I have to calculate the diameter of this sheave axle and here this is the symbol of the bearing and I have to find what kind of bearing we are using so sheave axle bearing would be decided and sheave axle diameter in this step now first I will draw a simple diagram of this axle so that we can understand what are the loads which are acting on this axle shaft so here is the diagram of that axle shaft in which these are the length of hub means these portions would be connected to the rope sheave so this is the length of the hub as I can explain it over here as well so these are the length of the hub which goes into this bearing so and in between them we have a spacer this part is called as the spacer and spacer is to be taken as 10 mm I am assuming this then exactly as we can see here at exactly 
the half of this hub would be the ropes which will pass so it means the load which would be acting will pass through these lines which are exactly at the center of the hub so therefore exactly at the center I am projecting the forces now since for one sheep we have two ropes because they would be connected on the circumference so explaining it over here that since we have the rope sheave here next the ropes would be passing like one rope would be there in front of us on one on this sheave other rope would go on to the other side so like this we have two ropes so therefore the amount of forces that is here this would be 2f that is 1f for one fall and 2f for two fall similarly on the other side we have 2f because it is a four fall system and since this part is held in the axle or we can say the axle is being is been held rigidly with the help of the cover plate as we see here in black sectioning this is the cover plate and here we have the shackle plate which are holding the axle so the load which is trying to pull this sheave up would be resisted by these plates and acting on the sheave axle in the downward direction so that would be located at now to explain it I'll mark the remaining lengths and I'm denoting them as S1 and S where S1 is the thickness of cover plate and S1 it is not given so assuming always assume S1 the thickness of the cover plate as 6 mm and S is the thickness of the shackle plate take it as 20 mm so these are the assumptions and now the 2f value which is supported by the axle will be ex acting exactly at the half of s similarly over here and they are equal to here 2f and 2f that is 4f so divided equally i'll say this is part a and this is part b so the load acting is 2F at A and 2F at B and on this diagram also I will explain it that here we have a cover plate in black sectioning its thickness is 6 mm as explained we have to assume this thickness of cover plate and in red what we are seeing is the shackle plate whose thickness is 20 mm and the function of the shackle plate as we see here is to connect the axle shaft with this cross piece as we can see over here now after reaching up till this stage and the length of hub is also known to us it is 108 mm and spacer is taken as 10 mm so now since it is being supported at a and b that is the axle is supported so the bending moment would be zero at the ends and the maximum bending moment will occur at the critical section which is over here where the load is acting so i'll say this is section one and here we have section two so the next step would be i'll be taking the moments at section one that is just by taking one half of this axle shaft so therefore considering the bending failure of the axle at section 1 1 so therefore the bending stress is given by it is the bending moment and since we are taking the bending moment at section 1 1 divided by the section modulus 
so therefore bending moment at section 1 1 I am taking the moment by considering only one side of the axial shaft so for that here we have 2f into this distance is exactly half that is s by 2 so we have 2f into s by 2 plus s1 plus lh by 2 so therefore 2f into s by 2 plus s1 plus lh by 2 divided by z and assuming that the section is circular z is the section modulus for a circular section it is pi by 32 d cube and here i am writing suffix a because we are designing it for the axial shaft so therefore putting the respective values and just for bending stress i am explaining that taking material of axial shaft as c45 so therefore from psg 1.9 Corresponding to C45, we have a yield tensile stress of 360 Newton per mm square. So we have on PSG 1.9, the material is C45. Corresponding to it, the yield stress is 36 kgf per mm square. So multiply it by 10 to get in terms of Newton per mm square. And so sigma yt is 360 Newton per mm square and assuming factor of safety as 3 for repeated loading so therefore sigma t permissible comes out to be sigma yt that is 360 divided by fos so it is 120 newton per mm square and tensile strength is taken as equal to the bending stress so sigma v value is known to us now putting all values over here therefore sigma v is 120 2 into f f value was the load acting per fall it is 33 it was 3315 kgf now here we want in terms of newton because stress is in terms of newton per mm square so remember that F value should be in terms of Newton. So the answer which we got in terms of kgf multiplied by 10 to get it in terms of Newton into bracket s by 2 s the thickness of the shackle plate is 20 so 20 by 2 plus the thickness of the cover plate mm the length of hub it was 108 mm already calculated divided by 2 and in the denominator we have pi by 32 the diameter of xl q so hence on calculating this the diameter comes out to be the diameter of xl and we are calculating it at section 11 it is 73.31 mm and same will be the diameter of xl at section 22 as well because the hub diameter is also same so here what i have done is i have determined the diameter of the axle shaft which goes into these rope sheaves through the bearings next the next sub step within this is to determine or selection of bearing between axle shaft and rope sheet so the next part is after i had calculated the diameter of this axle shaft next would be to decide which kind of bearing we are going to use so we are going to find the sheave axle bearing in this step and for that i can say that since the radial load acting on the bearing f suffix r is equal to 2f because clearly we can see that 
here there is a bearing and the load would be acting on this center line the load acting on the center line is 2f so this 2f is considered as the radial load f suffix r radial load f suffix r and this is the axis of the axle shaft and we can see that the load which would be acting would be along these axes and not the axis of the axle shaft so here i can say that axial load denoted by f suffix a on the axle shaft is zero so only radial load is to be considered in order to design the bearing between the rope shift and the axle shaft so therefore fr value would be 2 into f f is 3315 so it is 6630 kgf or by multiplying it with 10 i am getting it as 66 point 3 into 10 raised to 3 newton and dividing this by 10 raised to 3 will give me the answer in terms of kilo newton. So this is the radial load for which the bearing of the axle shaft needs to be designed and here we see that this load is very much greater than 8 kilo newton which is used as the reference to decide between the ball bearing or the roller bearing. So since this load is very much greater than 8 kilo newton so we are going to select a roller bearing, I am writing it over here. So here I have written that since the radial load is very very high compared to the value of 8 kN, so selecting roller bearing and not ball bearing because ball bearings won't be able to resist such high value of load. So therefore and at the same time there is a possibility of the axle to tilt because we know that since this is an EOT mechanism the crane would be travelling to and fro it would be moving up and down so there are chances of this axle to tilt so if we have a rigid bearing then it may lead to the axle being broken or the bearing may break so for that purpose we need to have some amount of flexible arrangement that is why we are going for spherical roller bearing and not the conventional roller bearing and now for the bearing design some assumptions we have to make that is first assuming the life of bearing in working hours denoted as L suffix H and here I am assuming it to be 10,000 hours we can also get it from the book Rudenko. Then the same life I'll calculate in millions of revolutions denoted as L suffix MR given by L suffix H into RPM multiplied by 60 divided by 10 raised to 6. Now how to get this RPM? I'll explain it over here. Now, since N indicates the RPM revolutions per minute of rope sheaf, so therefore it can be calculated from the peripheral velocity concept that is pi dn upon 60. Now, N is equal to and from this the unit would be in terms of meter per second and here if we want the unit in terms of meter per minute then the formula would just be v upon pi d because v is and this will give me the revolutions per minute so from this formula and v here I am giving the reference how to take V. It is equal to P is called as also called as Y dot is equal to I into X dot or you can say X dot now. Therefore, for I it is taken as also called as mechanical advantage 
and can be taken as half of the fall and since we know here it is a four fall system so this would be half into four so therefore i comes out to be two and x dot is the hoisting speed hoisting speed in terms of meter per minute and that was given in the question the hoisting speed was 10 meter per minute so that would be x dot here I have written v that is the general notation but in this case 10 meter per minute this is x dot so therefore x dot is 10 meter per minute now y dot is equal to i into x dot i is 2 x dot is 10 so it is 2 into 10 that is the numerator divided by d now the rope shape is 667 mm and divide this by 1000 will give me the answer in terms of meter so velocity is 20 here in the numerator we have 20 in the denominator we have pi into d which is 0 0.667 because in terms of meter so n comes out to be in terms of rpm therefore n value will be equal to 9.54 rpm now remember this is the revolution speed or we can say this is the rotary speed of the rope sheaf we can say that the rope which is passing through the rope sheaf rope sheaf is having an rpm of 9.54 just now I had calculated this so now we can say that this rope sheaf would be rotating with a speed of 9.54 rpm so putting the values over here to get the millions of revolution it is 5.724 millions of revolutions now after this assuming 90% probability of survival so therefore L10 is equal to LMR which is 5.724 millions of revolutions this is the value of L10 now calculating the equivalent load so therefore from PSG 4.2 equivalent load is given by P suffix E is equal to x into v into fr plus y into fa into bracket s into k suffix t I'll explain each of the terms now on PSG 4.2 here we have the formula of equivalent load it is x into fr so this was an older version of the PSG so here we had x into fr remember to multiply with v as well because v indicates either it is inner race rotation or external race rotation then fr is the radial load plus y into the thrust y is the thrust factor fa is the axial load s is the duty factor or we can say it is the service factor next service factor can be seen from here it is for rotary machine with no impact between 1.1 to 1.5 so yes it is a rotary machine and there is no load falling from height so no impact so 1.1 to 1.5 take the average so I am getting s value as 1.3 and add kt it is in the formula multiply with kt that is the temperature factor if nothing is given about temperature take it as 1 so here putting the values one by one x value is 1 that is the radial factor then v is 1.2 so capital V is equal to 1 that is for inner race rotation that is if there is a rotating shaft we have to take v is equal to 1 and v is equal to 1.2 for outer race rotation that is in case of axle so here as we know 
so here the factor v is equal to 1.2 for outer race rotation as explained the rope sheaf would be rotating axle is fixed so the factor is 1.2 fr value that is the radial load in terms of kilo newton it was 66.3 kilo newton plus now since the axial load is zero because no axial load is acting on the axle shaft so this entire term can be taken as zero s is the service factor and we can get it from psg 4.2 for rotary machine with no impact between 1.1 to 1.5 to so take the average that is 1.3 then kt is the temperature factor k sub xt take it as one if nothing is mentioned about the temperature now on calculating this i am getting the equivalent load and it comes out to be 103.428 kilo newton now after getting the equivalent load i will be using the formula on same psg 4.2 that is the dynamic capacity formula wherein c is equal to l upon l10 into p raise to 1 by k where k is 3 for ball bearings and 10 by 3 for roller bearings since we are using roller bearing here k value would be 10 by 3 so therefore this formula would be written now here l10 is the l suffix mr value which is 5.724 C is what we have to calculate that is the dynamic capacity of the bearing equivalent load in terms of kilo newton 103 0.428 raised to power k and k is equal to 10 by 3 this is for roller bearings and since we have selected roller bearing here so k value would be 10 by 3 and if it would have been ball bearing k value would have been 3 now on calculating this I am getting the answer of C as 174.56 kilo newton. Now I want the answer in terms of kgf so first I will convert this in terms of newton so it is 174.56 into 10 raised to 3 newton. Now dividing this by 10 will give me the answer in terms of kgf and it comes out to be it is 17456 kgf so 17456 kgf now therefore from psg 4.32 as we can see here from psg 4.32 the heading it is spherical roller bearings and go into the dynamic capacity part the dynamic capacity which we have is 17456 so it is just the value here it is 15300 and the next higher value is 18000 so the value which we have that is 17456 is closer to this value of 18000 so selecting this bearing which is the bearing number is 222 it is 222 series so 22217C so therefore selecting a standard spherical roller bearing of number triple two one seven C for which the dynamic capacity C is eighteen thousand kgf and therefore the diameter of the shaft is equal to because when we look at the bearing diagram d small d is the inner diameter of the bearing or in this diameter there will be the axle shaft because the bearing which we are designing it is for the axle shaft so the axle shaft diameter should be equal to this inner diameter and for the series which we have selected the inner diameter is 85 now therefore the diameter of shaft should be 85 mm and previously the axle shaft diameter which we had calculated it was the axle diameter came out to be 73.31 and now 
here I can say that this axle shaft diameter which is going inside the sheaf it comes out to be the answer was 73.31 and here I had not round off this answer the reason being after bearing selection the diameter changes to 85 so therefore now this will be the diameter for Excel because that is the standard value so therefore the diameter increases now so I will say that therefore let's now round off Excel shaft diameter so now the Excel shaft diameter at both section 1 1 and section 2 2 will be 85 mm that is after the bearing selection and next is we can see that this axle shaft is having a step here there is a stepping means this diameter is less than the axle shaft that is the diameter which goes into the cover plate and the shackle plate is lesser so therefore So the diameter of XL which goes inside the shackle plate which is this smaller diameter I am assuming stepping of 2.5 mm so 2.5 from one side 2.5 from other side it has been subtracted so the diameter is 80 mm in the shackle plate next and remember we are in the first step only that is here the entire part which we are designing that is the snatch block which is going on so now after the bearing has been selected next is selection of standard hook now we have to select the hook so here since the safe load or the permissible load carried by the hook denoted as w suffix h is equal to the load to be lifted multiplied by the duty factor it means we have to increase the amount of load for which we are designing this EOT crane the load to be lifted is 12 tons given in the problem so we have to increase that value by multiplying with duty factor and duty factor we had previously seen it was on PSG 9.2 for class 2 crane so we had seen on PSG 9.2 for class 2 crane and strength condition the duty factor was taken as 1.2 so now the same duty factor I am taking that is 1.2 into the load to be lifted 12 tons is 12 into 10 raised to 3 multiplied by duty factor of 1.2 so it means the capacity of the hook will increase and it will be 14.4 into 10 raised to 3 kg or we can say 14.4 tons so now the hook instead of lifting a maximum load of 12 tons can even resist a load of 14.4 tons then therefore selecting high tensile steel high tensile steel as the material for the hook for which the tensile stress is equal to 200 Newton per mm square and this value is from the book Rudian Co and therefore from maximum shear stress theory the permissible shear stress is 0 0.5 into sigma t so it is 100 Newton per mm square now therefore selecting after reaching up to here selecting the standard proportions 
standard proportions for the hook and for that from PSG 9.11 now here we have on psg 9.11 the standard trapezoidal section point hooks with shanks so this is the cross section or we can say the diagram of the hook given and we have to select that which kind of hook it is so we can always go for the safe load in terms of tons it is given here we have up it is 0.5 so it is up to 0.5 then it is up to 1 ton up to 2 ton so similarly the value which we require here it is 14.4 tons 14.4 tons so for that we are going to select 16 because this is it can resist a value of up to 16 tons and from that we have to select capital C capital C is the dimension upon which the remaining dimensions of the hook are finalized so we can say that that is the basic dimension over which all the dimensions are fixed empirically so c value out of 151 and 131 select the minimum value in order to save the material so here i am selecting for 16 tons c value as 131 i am writing the reference of the psg as well so therefore C value is 131 mm and therefore I am writing the remaining dimensions for this hook like I can explain it over here. The various dimensions of the hook are this height A is given it is 2.75 into C. C is 131 then capital B is the height over here which is 1.31 into C next capital D the remaining height it is 1.44 into C so just go on multiplying with C which is 131 and we'll get all the dimensions all the major dimensions of this crane hook so now what I'll do here is I'll multiply with C to all the values which have been given here and I'll directly write the answers from A to Z like for example at last when we are seeing Z here Z is the radius over here of this hook so I'm fixing all the dimensions and writing the values so therefore after selecting Now after reaching up till here on that same page that is 9.11 the load we have seen here and corresponding to it we have selected capital C value. Now here we have G minimum value as 70 and the size of bolt that is the threaded portion over here its size is given it is M68 size of threading here and the pitch is 6 mm at the same time the thrust bearing is also given the number is 513 so all these parameters I will write it over here therefore G1 capital G1 is equal to M68 and remember this 68 the number after M M means metric thread the number which is over here it indicates the nominal diameter of the thread so the nominal diameter becomes 68 mm and therefore we have the relation between nominal and core so core diameter would be 0.84 multiplied by the nominal diameter which is 68 so therefore the core diameter will come out to be 57.12 mm so that is the core diameter and m means the metric threads at the same time g minimum we can see here there is a column of G minimum so corresponding to this 131 value G minimum is 70 so that is this dimension G minimum is this shank over here so 
g minimum is 70 and pitch on this same page is 6 mm and the thrust bearing number is on G series is equal to 530 so it means that the bearing is also selected for the hook and pitch for M68 it is 6 mm core series given over here so after deciding the proportions now I'll draw the line diagram of the hook so now here I'll draw the line diagram of the hook So here I have drawn the line diagram of the hook in which I have drawn three sections over here. First W suffix H is the weight which is acting on the hook and that is 14.4 tons. To resist that here we have the CG of the hook. This is the CG of the hook and this W by H is acting in the upward and the downward direction in, in order to balance the load. Then Capital R is the distance from the CG to the point of application of the load. Now we have to check the stresses which are there in these sections. So for that in order to check the stresses first we need to know the cross section. So therefore from PSG 6.3 the cross section of the hook. So from PSG 6.3 the cross section of the hook can be approximated as a trapezium as shown below. So the cross section is assumed to be a trapezium because here it is not an exact trapezium as we see some amount of curvature is there but still we can approximate as a trapezium cross section. So therefore so here on PSG 6.3 this is the trapezium section. At the top it is written as curved beams, the cross sections are given circular, rectangular, then unsymmetrical I, uns, uh, T section and then here we have a trapezium section and for that R suffix N, small r suffix N and capital R are given. These are the dimensions. Now this entire diagram I am going to draw it again and then we can look at this formula. So I am copying this formula as well and then I'll explain each of the terms one by one. Now since this Ri value, I will explain each of them step by step. Ri is the inner radius of the hook and since we had previously seen the dimension capital C on PSG 9.11 where capital C was the diameter, inner diameter of this hook. So Ri is the inner radius and therefore Ri is equal to half of C. C was 131 divided by 2. So therefore Ri value is equal to 65.5 mm. Next here this HO value is equal to the capital H because on PSG 9.11 it is capital H and here it is small h as we can see here on PSG 9.11 this is capital H so here we can say height of the trapezium and over here the notation is small h I am writing it as h suffix o so that is h value was 121.83 mm then 
After that, here we have in this trapezium section, G is the centroid of this trapezium. So the axis passing through the centroid is called as the centroidal axis. Location of the centroidal axis, this is the center line of the hook, the center of the hook. So from, so from the center to the centroidal axis CC, the distance is denoted as capital R. And next, from the center of the hook to the neutral axis, neutral axis, the distance is R suffix N. Then R suffix I is the inner radius as explained of the hook and R suffix O would be the outer radius of the hook. Then BI is the inner width of the hook and BO is the outer width. As we can see, the load is acting towards the inner width, towards the inner width. So at the inner side, the width is more that is the area is greater compared to the outer portion because at outer side, the load is not there. Similarly, inside of the hook, we can see when the load would be acting, it would be trying to make this hook straight. That is on the inner side, we have tension and on the outer side, we have compression. So now the distance of the neutral axis from the center line of the hook is R suffix N. Then there is eccentricity E, the distance between the centroidal axis and the neutral axis denoted as small e and from the neutral axis up to where the cross section ends that is called as hi as can be seen over here. Now ho we have got just now the height of the this trapezium therefore ro value it can be said that ro is made up of ri plus ho so I can say that ro is equal to ri plus ho ri is 65.5 plus 121.83 mm. So therefore, our O value comes out to be 187.33 mm. Then this outer width BO is taken as 2 into Z. This relation we have to remember and Z value was 15.72. So I'm getting the outer width as 31.44 mm that is BO value. Then for BI value, it is equal to M. These relations are empirical. So we have to remember them and M value came out to be 78.6. So we can clearly see that the inner width is greater than the outer width. Now after finalizing these dimensions, I'll go on to the same PSG page number 6.3, PSG 6.3 and I'll write this small Rn formula. Here it is written half, I can write 0 0.5, then capital R formula. So I'll be getting small Rn and capital R from this. So therefore, small Rn, which is distance from center line of hook to the neutral axis in terms of mm and the formula for Rn is so once we put all the values that is bi bo h and the remaining values i am getting the value of Rn r suffix n i am writing the answer directly it comes out to be 108.01 mm and similarly capital R is Ri plus H by 3 Bi plus 2 twice of BO upon Bi plus BO since we know all the values over here so therefore capital R comes out to be 117.71 mm so from capital R and Rn I can say that from capital R if I subtract Rn I am going to get the value of this eccentricity E so therefore eccentricity E is equal to capital R minus Rn so therefore capital R is 117.71 
minus Rn is 108.01. So from this, the eccentricity comes out to be, it is 9.7 mm. Then after this, I'll get the cross section area that is therefore the cross section area of trapezium hook that area is given by small a is equal to half into the sum of parallel sides the sum of parallel sides that is it is bi plus bo multiplied by the height which is ho bi is 78.6 plus bo 31.44 into ho 121.83 so on calculating this small a value comes out to be in terms of mm square it is 6703.09 mm square now here once i finalized all the dimensions of the hook and found the cross section area we are going to check the stresses in the hook so considering section 11 which is over here because of the load which is acting on the hook this being a threaded portion and in the threads the weakest portion is the core of the core diameter or core area of the thread so it would be subjected to tension as the load is acting in the downward direction and so the threads are going to extend and fail due to tension so let us check the stresses in the hook considering section 11 tensile failure of the threads wherein dc is the core diameter and this is the failing area of the threads because whenever we have a threaded portion in that we have the core diameter dc and then the nominal diameter do so threads will fail at dc always because of the less less amount of area or we can say the weakest section so that is the tensile failure and it will be given by that since the tensile stress is equal to load upon area load is carried by the hook upon pi by 4 dc square because load upon area is the stress so therefore tensile stress will be equal to the load is 14.4 tons so when i multiply it with 10 raised to 3 it will be in terms of kgf and when I multiply it with 10 again, it will be in the form of Newton. So divide this by pi by 4 and DC is the core diameter, which was 57.12 mm. So hence on calculating this, the tensile stress comes out to be, it is 56.19 Newton per mm square. So therefore, comparing this value with the stress tensile stress in the hook that was 200 so since this value is less than the permissible value of 200 newton per mm square so therefore the hook is safe under tension next after checking the stress at section 1 1 then we'll check the stress at section 2 and it is very much clear that when the load is acting it is going to shear off it is going to break the hook in two parts like it is just shearing off because of the load being present here so at section 2 the hook is subjected to shear stress so therefore considering section second shearing stress in the hook is given by tau is equal to load upon area and here the area would be the cross section area this is the cross section area of hook so therefore tau will be equal to again the load is 14.4 into 10 raised to 3 multiplied by 10 divided by cross section area it was 6703.09 so therefore tau comes out to be 21.48 newton per mm square and again this value is also less than the tau permissible value tau permissible was 100 newton per mm square so therefore hook is safe under shear then the third type of failure 
we can see that the load is acting at an eccentricity from the CG. So section 3 would be subjected to both direct as well as bending stress. As mentioned, inner layers are subjected to tension, outer layers to compression because of the load. The load will try to make this hook straight, that is it will try to pull the hook in the reverse direction. So here we have tension and the other side the compression. So next, then we go for the third section. It means up till now we can say that the hook is safe under tension, it is safe under shear. Now analyzing section 3.3, for that we can see that the load is acting away from the CG because here is the CG So and the distance between the load and the CG is capital R. So it means at first when we analyze section 3 due to the load WH, this hook is going to break into two halves. So that effect is called as direct stress and due to the eccentricity that is capital R, there will be bending moment produced as we can see here. W into H R will be the bending moment which is produced over this cross section. So I can easily say that at section 3, 3, 3 there will be direct stress as well as bending stress. So subjected to both direct and bending stresses, direct stress sigma suffix D is given by load upon area load 14.4 into 10 raised to 3 that is kgf into 10 newton upon the cross sectional area. So we get the direct stress. Now bending stress, bending stress is given by the formula m suffix b into hi upon ae ri and this bending stress formula is there on PSG, PSG 6.2 for inside fiber. So here we have on PSG 6.2 the at the top we have curved beams for that we have to look for inside fiber and the formula is as we can see here for inside fiber. The formula is sigma b max, it is this formula, sigma b suffix max is equal to mb into hi upon aeri. So here is the formula of sigma b max and from this mb is wh into r as we see it is load into the eccentricity, w suffix h again it would be put in terms of Newton and capital R value it came out to be it was one 117.71 mm so this was the value of capital R and on calculating this I am getting m suffix b as 16.95 10 raised to 6 newton mm so putting the value over here then h suffix i is equal to rn minus ri here we have h suffix i this much distance is Rn. From that, when I subtract Ri, I am going to get Hi. So, Rn value. Rn is 108.01 mm and Ri is 65.5. So, when I subtract them, I am going to get the answer of Hi, putting it over here. Then, small a is the cross sectional area 6703.09 mm square into E. This E is the distance between the centroidal axis and the neutral axis denoted by small e it came out to be 9.7 mm so putting the value of small e into ri and on calculating this i am getting the answer of sigma suffix bi that is the bending stress on the internal fiber 169.19 newton per mm square next once we know the direct stress and the bending stress we can put the values and calculate the answer for the resultant stress and the answer comes out to be it is 170.55 newton per mm square and again we can say this value should be compared with sigma t permissible which is 200 newton per mm square so now we can say that even section 33 of the hook is safe under direct as well as bending stresses so the hook which we have designed it is safe now after the design of the hook the next component is so the next part is the design of the cross piece and the selection of thrust bearing so when we look at the diagram cross piece is this machine element which is located over here and just above the cross piece we have the thrust bearing the thrust bearing is providing support to this crane hook as we can see here. So at first I will be designing the thrust bearing that is we should know which kind of bearing we have to select and 
here this is the thrust bearing at the same time when we are looking at this hook then the shank of the hook which passes through this bearing would be the dimension with the help of which the bearing would be decided and at the same time i can give an example like for example the axle shaft the axle shaft was fixed whereas the rope sheave was rotating around it but here there is no rotation so this point you have to remember and now for the design of the thrust bearing taking the shank diameter of the hook as the reference so for the selection of thrust bearing the reference would be this g minimum value of 70 mm which was the shank diameter for the hook and it is seen on psg page 9.11 we had already seen that dimension so here on psg 9.11 g minimum value was 70 and we can see here this portion of the hook will go inside the thrust bearing so based upon that the design would be there so selection of thrust bearing so therefore from psg 4.28 selecting 513 series i'll explain how this series comes bearing corresponding corresponding to a shank diameter of 70 mm as i have explained it so here when we see on psg 4.28 at the top it is written single thrust ball bearing series 513 from which we have to select now go for this small d value because that is the inner diameter of the bearing and that corresponds to the shank diameter of the hook and the value should be 70 mm so the value here is 70 mm we can see and the series is 513 that is the bearing number 513 and then 14 so we are selecting this bearing therefore selecting 51314 bearing number now here i I'll, i'll write an important hint over here that since the shaft is static therefore no need to calculate the dynamic capacity then millions of revolutions and equivalent load so there is no need of these calculations which were previously done for the axle shaft the simple reason being that as explained that this shaft which goes inside the thrust bearing is stationary means the shaft is not rotating so it is not subjected to dynamic load but it is subjected to the static load so therefore i'll take the static load for this bearing number from psg 4.28 so therefore static load denoted as c suffix 0 will be equal to so on same psg 4.28 corresponding to the bearing number 14 which i had selected we have to go for the static load at the top it is written basic capacity in terms of kgf static is c suffix 0 value is 20000 27700 if it would have been dynamic load then the value would have been different so here i am writing the static value 27700 kgf when it is converted into newton or i can say into tons divide this by 1000 so that becomes 27.7 tons and therefore we can easily compare that this co value is greater than the load w suffix h w suffix h was 14.4 tons so now it means the bearing can take more amount of load compared to the value of load which is required so therefore the bearing is safe and now i'll take the dimensions of the bearing also so from psg 4.28 and psg 4.27 just a page before 4.27 here is the diagram of that single thrust ball bearing as we can see here capital d is the outer diameter of the bearing small d is the inner diameter corresponding to the shank of the hook then we have a diameter d2 as well by taking some clearance and h is the height of this bearing so i'll draw this simple diagram and write the proportions those proportions are to be taken from the bearing number here we have small d capital d we have d2 value and we have h value so i'll just draw a simple diagram of the bearing showing these dimensions
the inner diameter is 70 mm and we can say that this is the upper race of the bearing and here is the lower race and in the lower race we have a slightly larger diameter proportion is taken from PSG 4.28 corresponding to the bearing number so small d is 70 mm d2 is 72 mm and the outer diameter is 125 mm then the height is 40 mm and here the diameter of the bearing capital D I'll denote it as D suffix B so this is the diagram of the thrust bearing which we had selected so it is the single thrust ball bearing and the actual diagram of the thrust bearing will be like this that is the thrust bearing will have an outer ring next there will be the inner ring or called as the inner race then there is this cage in golden as we see here inside which there would be balls fitted so this is the actual diagram of the single thrust ball bearing which we have designed just now so we can understand it and inside this part will go the shank of the hook and so once I had reached here next part which I am going to explain is the cross piece and this is the actual diagram of the cross piece the same cross piece which we can see in this diagram it is this member which we are going to design as we can see on the cross piece the thrust bearing is kept but directly the thrust bearing is not kept between the cross piece and the thrust bearing there will be a spherical washer and that spherical washer would be placed over this cross piece as we can see here over this the spherical washer is placed and just above it the thrust bearing would be placed and this inner diameter is also corresponding to the shank of the hook so the hook passes through the cross piece the hook will pass through the cross piece then through the thrust bearing then through the th thrust bearing also through the spherical washer and finally by using the lock nut arrangement we can lock it in a particular position so this is the part which is called as the cross piece which we are going to design now and again here I'll explain that on this cross piece a spherical washer is going to be placed by looking at the uh, cross piece we can clearly say that it is square in cross section so the width and height would be same then here it is a circular section and this this part this circular section would be attached to both the cover plate as well as the shackle plate and the part of that cross piece which goes into the shackle plate is called as the tronian so now here i'll explain that the portion which is there in red which i am shading it over here the thickness of this portion denoted as s1 s1 this thickness is corresponding to the thickness of the cover plate the plate which we are seeing here cover plate having a thickness of 6 mm and whatever is left after the cover plate becomes the thickness of the shackle plate so it means after S1 the portion which we are seeing in this black section now this is the thickness of the shackle plate denoted by S the thickness of the shackle plate denoted by S and this portion which is there in black which goes in the shackle plate is called as the pronian so now we have to start the design of the cross piece and first I'll fix, fix the dimension of the spherical washer which we are going to fit over here so therefore So therefore the diameter the diameter of the spherical washer which would be placed in the cross piece denoted as capital D1 is equal to the diameter of the bearing which is corresponding to the outer diameter plus 5 mm clearance. So therefore it comes out to be 130 mm 
So this will be the diameter of the spherical washer which is kept in the cross piece. Now into the cross piece design, here I have drawn the diagram showing the various forces which are acting on the cross piece. At first, here is the front view of the cross piece and this is the top view. When we look at the diagram, we can say that the cross piece is a square section having width capital B and we can say the depth is W. So assuming the shape of the cross piece is square, B is equal to W and it is taken as 226 mm and that is nothing but the distance between the cover plate. So once we know B value, then whatever the forces are acting on the cross piece, first I'll explain them in a step by step manner. At first what happens is here at the center there will be the hook over which the load W suffix H is attached and that load gets distributed equally it means half of that that is wh by 2 wh by 2 is distributed along this center line which is center line xx so here and this diameter at the top in the cross piece is d1 where d1 was the diameter of the spherical washer which would be placed in the cross piece so it means the groove which is there in this cross piece is corresponding to diameter D1 over which the spherical washer will fit. So from the center up to the end here we have half of D1 then half of D1 on one side. So WH by 2 is acting at half of D1 by 2. So since it is we can say that up to here there is the radius D1 by 2. So exactly at half of this that is D1 by 4 WH by 2 is acting similarly the remaining half at D1 by 4 WH by 2 is acting and this is treated the load which is acting on the spherical washer is treated as a UDL which can be seen over here and UDL since it is the intensity of loading that is it depends upon load per unit distance so it is WH upon D1 which is the intensity of this UDL, WH is the weight which is attached to the hook, D1 is the length over which it is acting. So load upon length that is the UDL. Next when we take this section we can see that the center part is hollow which is corresponding to D2 and D2 is the diameter of roller lower race of thrust bearing. So the lower race will fit over here. Next after this here capital T is the overall thickness or height we can say of the cross piece that height capital T is made up of small t plus a so I can write over here capital T is equal to small t plus a where a is the height of this groove over which the spherical washer is going to fit then here s1 and s s1 is the thickness of the cover plate as I had explained previously with the help of this diagram that S1 is the thickness of the cover plate which is 6 mm and S is the thickness of the shackle plate which is 20 mm. So your S1 thickness of the cover plate S2 this is half of the thickness of the shackle plate and why so that I will explain because as we can see in this diagram as well. When the load is acting in the downward direction at that time, when the load is acting in the downward direction, then whatever part is supported in the shackle plate, which I have said it is called as the tronion. So these tronions over which these tronions are going to resist this load. It means if the load is acting in the downward direction, reactions are offered by the tronion at exactly half of the thickness of the shackle plate. So these are the reactions offered and they are half of the load because at center we know WH by 2 would be acting WH exactly would be acting. Now this WH gets divided on both the sides so we have WH by 2 on one side W suffix H by 2 on the other side. So it means when the load is acting at the hook, 
that same load will pass through the spherical washer as well as the cross piece and that load is resisted by pronion which is there inside the shackle plate so the load gets divided equally and we can say that it can be treated as a simply supported beam with point load at the center and offering the support reactions so wh by 2 is acting at s by 2 which is half of the thickness of the shackle plate and s1 is the thickness of the cover plate b by 2 is from the center up to this end then after that once i have explained it up till here next i'll be calculating the moment at this section xx because now capital b value is known to us it is 226 mm what we require is capital d for that small t should be known to us so what i am doing i would be calculating the moment at section xx so when i see any one side of the cross piece because it is a symmetric section so when i am seeing if suppose the left side of the cross piece and my assumption is that clockwise moments are treated as positive and anti clockwise moments are treated as negative so here we have wh by 2 when i take the moment at the center so it is coming into the clockwise direction and it will be given by wh by 2 that is the force into the distance is s by 2 plus s1 plus b by 2 so that is the total distance between wh by 2 and x this total distance then since it is clockwise it would be positive after that here also we have wh by 2 which is acting at a distance of d1 by 4 but it will be producing a moment in an anti clockwise sense about the x axis so it will be treated as negative wh by 2 minus d1 by 4 and that will give me the moment or summation of moment about section xx so in the cross piece design about section xx i'm taking the moment so therefore summation of moment about xx as explained it will be first wh by 2 into the distance which is s by 2 plus s1 plus b by 2 minus wh by 2 into d1 by 4 so this is the equation of the bending moment now just going on putting the values wh the load is 14.4 tons so into 10 raised to 3 will give me the answer in kgf into 10 it gets converted into newton divided by 2 s is the thickness of the shackle plate that is 20 mm assumed and s1 is 6 mm plus b is taken as 226 mm d1 is the diameter of the cross piece where the spherical washer will fit so d1 value was 130 so it is 130 divided by 4 and on calculating this i am getting the answer as it is 6.948 into 10 raised to 6 newton mm so that is the summation of moment of all forces about section xx after that i have to assume the material for the cross piece so now so we are assuming the same material for the cross piece as the rope sheep and for the rope sheep the material which we had assumed or we can say the rope sheaf axle to be more precise we are assuming the same material as the rope sheaf axle that was c45 so therefore for c45 we know that it is from psg 1.9 so you all can refer it c45 i had also explained it at the time of designing the axle shaft so sigma t is 120 newton per mm square and remember this 120 it comes after dividing by factor of safety so that will be the same value of the bending stress as well because whatever is the tensile stress value same will be the bending stress value then and from psg you all can refer for axle shaft 
द सिग्मा वाई टी वैल्यू इज थ्री सिक्सटी न्यूटन पर एम एम स्क्वेयर एंड द एफ ओ एस वैल्यू आई डूम इट एज थ्री सो सेम कंडीशन आई एम यूजिंग फॉर द क्रॉस पीस एज वेल नाउ वंस वी नो सिग्मा टी द एंड द समेशन ऑफ बेंडिंग मोमेंट नेक्स्ट इज नाउ आई एल बी कैलक्युलेटिंग द सेक्शन मॉड्यूलस फॉर द क्रॉस पीस now from the diagram of the cross piece it is very much clear that it can be treated as a simply supported beam and when the load is acting this pronion or we can say this cross piece will bend in the horizontal plane so the neutral axis is horizontal so what i'll be doing here is i'll be calculating the section modulus of this cross piece but not of entire height i'll be considering only up till where this small t ends for simplicity so my this section of cross piece is having a width of capital b and the height which i am taking that will be small t so from this outer portion or outer rectangle of capital b by small t i am going to subtract this inner rectangle which is having width d2 and the height is small t so in this way i am going to get the answer of section modulus and once small t is calculated i'll go for capital t as well so neglect small a first for simplicity and go for the section modulus so i'll say that since section modulus for the cross piece about the neutral axis it will be z about the neutral axis is equal to the formula would be since we are calculating it about the horizontal axis because that is the neutral axis so we can say that this horizontal axis is cutting the dimension small t and it is parallel to the dimension capital b again i'll explain this neutral axis is perpendicular to or cutting small t and it is parallel to b so therefore the formula would become b since it is parallel it will remain as it is b and small t is cut by this neutral axis so small t cube so first i am writing this as it is i about the neutral axis divided by y because that is the formula of section modulus now first i i is about the neutral axis so i have explained it is b t cube by 12 minus neutral axis see that it is parallel to b and it is cutting small t so small t cube b t cube by 12 minus then d2 neutral axis is parallel to d2 so minus d2 and again the height of this portion is small t so neutral axis is cutting small t so we have t cube divided by 12 so this is the i value about neutral axis divided by see why for this i am showing the shortcut whatever is the cubic term here t is having cube so y is exactly half of that that is t by 2 and this can also be explained over here that here we have the neutral axis so y is the distance from the neutral axis to the topmost fiber or up to the bottommost fiber in both the cases y would be equal to t by 2 t by 2 so therefore i am putting the values in a step by step manner capital b is 226 t is what we have to calculate here d2 d2 was the diameter inside the lower rays of the thrust bearing so d2 was 72 into t cube division here it becomes multiplication so we have reciprocal which is 2 upon t and here on to the thrust bearing diagram we can check in the lower rays the diameter d2 is 72 because this thrust bearing would be kept on the spherical washer which in turn would be kept on the cross piece next so therefore the z neutral axis will be equal to 25.67 t square and here the unit would be in terms of mm cube Uh, don't get confused by looking at t square and the unit is mm cube 
already we have put the value of v so it is also in terms of mm even d2 is mm so whatever the calculation we have done the units which we are going to get they are justified so neutral x uh, z about neutral axis will have the unit of mm cube now after getting z value i can say that since we have assumed the material of the cross piece same as ro the rope sheave excel and sigma t is 120 which is same as the bending stress so i can say that after this since bending stress is given as sigma b is equal to summation of moment about x axis divided by the z about neutral axis and this comes from the flexural formula flexural formula from which we have m upon i is equal to sigma b upon y so therefore m is equal to i shifts over there so i upon y into sigma b and therefore i upon y is called as z so finally the formula is sigma b into z so therefore bending stress is m by z so we can check this then therefore the values sigma b it it is 120 summation of moment came out to be 6.948 into 10 raised to 6 divided by the z value so on calculating this i am getting the answer of small t which is 47.49 mm which i can round off and make it as 48 mm now after getting small t i can find capital t and capital t is made up of small t plus a a here i'll assume 8 mm so therefore capital t will be 56 mm so into the cross piece design we have reached up till this stage next is i'll be designing the tonian which is again a part of the cross piece which goes into the shackle blade so design of tonian now tonian is that part of the cross piece which goes in the shackle plate it is this portion which goes in the shackle plate and it is circular in section that is tronian is not hollow but it is a solid circular section and since we can see that it is at this critical section so because of the load which is acting and the load would be acting from the downward direction as we can see here they are offering the reactions so because of which it is going to break at this critical junction by bending so because of the presence of wh by 2 there would be a moment which would be acting at this junction i am calling it as junction a suffix a a so that is the critical section it means because of wh by 2 the tronian will bend over this section and fail so therefore design of tronian considering the bending failure of tronian so therefore the moment about section aa is wh by 2 into the distance which is s1 thickness of the cover plate plus s by 2 the thickness of the shackle plate i can show it onto the diagram here we have wh by 2 made up of s by 2 plus s1 because this is the distance which is required so it is half of the thickness of the shackle plate plus s1 the thickness of the cover plate putting the respective values 14.4 tons into 10 raised to 3 kgf into 10 newton divided by 2 into s1 is 6 mm plus s is 20 so therefore on calculating this i am getting the bending moment at section aa and the answer is 1.15 into 10 raised to 6 newton millimeter now therefore as explained that tonian is a circular section it is circular in cross section the diameter of tonian is denoted as d suffix t so this is the cross section of the tonian after failing and therefore the section modulus for the circular section is z is equal to i upon y and since it is a circular section 
either we take it about x or y the answer would be same so therefore and here we'll take it about x axis because that is the neutral axis so therefore i is pi by 64 dt raised to 4 divided by y which is dt by 2 that is the radius so therefore z is pi by 32 d suffix t cube so that is the section modulus for the tonian section unit is mm cube now therefore the bending stress will be given by moment about section aa divided by the section modulus and therefore bending stress would be same because the cross piece contains the tonian so it is 120 moment 1.5 into 10 raised to 6 1.15 into 10 raised to 6 divided by z is pi by 32 dt cube so therefore from this the diameter of tonian comes out to be it is 46.04 mm so we had designed the tonian as well in the cross piece next considering the shearing failure of tonian also we can say that since because of wh by 2 which is acting exactly at the half of the shackle plate the tonian may shear that is the load will try to take the tonian along with it so here there would be sliding at section aa previously we had taken bending into consideration now because of wh by 2 the tonian will slide and then it will break so that is called a shear failure so considering the shearing failure of the tonian shear stress is given by tau is equal to load upon area load is wh by 2 area will be the cross section area of the tonian that is pi by 4 into dt square and it is a case of single shear and tau value remember that sigma b is 120 so according to the maximum shear stress theory tau is taken exactly half of the bending or the tensile stress so tau will become 60 and here instead of putting the tau value either we can check either we can check the tau value or we can find the diameter of tonian by the different conditions so from the first condition i can say diameter of tonian is 46.04 now in this case I will take the next condition and see the diameter of tonian. We can check the stresses as well that is also correct. So pi by 4 dt square wh by 2. So from this the diameter of tonian comes out to be it is 39.09 mm. So I am getting two different diameters from two different conditions. Now I will use the third kind of failure that is considering the bearing failure. So there will be bearing failure because the tonian will be held rigidly that is this black portion goes into the shackle plate. So shackle plate and tonian at the same time when the load is acting there will be bearing which is called as the local compression in this region because of which there will be wear and tear and for the bearing the area which we take that is not the complete cross section but the projected area so therefore that projected area will be so this is s the thickness or the distance of the trunion which goes into the shackle plate and this is the diameter of the trunion d suffix t so that's the bearing area so therefore now bearing stress sigma suffix br is taken as 0.6 times the tensile stress so you all can remember this proportion it is 0.6 into 120 so it is 72 newton per mm square and also the bearing stress is given by it is load upon area the load is wh by 2 area is s into dt therefore bearing stress is 72 w value in terms of newton so from the bearing consideration 
the diameter of tunian comes out to be 50 mm now when we check the three conditions we had used first by considering the bending failure diameter of tunian was 46.04 considering shear the diameter was 39.09 considering bearing failure the diameter is 50 mm so out of them always select the maximum dimension that is the maximum diameter that is if the tunian is able to resist bearing then it can even resist shear and bending because the diameter is greater so that is the tunian design now after that i'll write down a stepping is provided in the tunian that is providing 2.5 mm stepping so that a collar is attached to the tunian and then the pin is inserted so therefore when the stepping is provided it becomes the diameter of the tunian for the remaining portion is 45 mm and same would be the diameter of pin of pin attached in collar so as to prevent the shackle plate from getting removed from the cross piece or from the tunian it means for the locking arrangement we have a tunian then we give the stepping of 2.5 mm and in that stepping a collar is inserted and a pin is inserted so so that it becomes a complete assembly and that diameter of pin attached in the collar is 45 mm next after that we have the design of shackle plate after the tunian and cross piece first i'll draw the section of the shackle plate so this is the width of the shackle plate denoted by w suffix s then we have the height of the shackle plate denoted as h suffix s and the center to center distance for the shackle plate which is c suffix s and in the shackle plate two holes would be provided because here when we look at the shackle plate it is this plate which is there in this red section it has two holes one hole for the axle shaft and another hole for the tunian diameter so at top the axle shaft diameter is 80 mm we have calculated it and just now we have calculated the diameter of tunian so these holes are present at the same time we know the thickness thickness would be seen in this view it is 20 mm but width is not there with us so we have to find the width at the same time these clearances or gap from the top of the shackle plate up to where the hole starts it is empirically taken as at the top it is 1.5 times the diameter of the axle shaft and at the bottom that same distance is 1.5 times the tunian diameter so for simplicity we are keeping it as 1.5 and depending upon the diameters which are there so we can take the top or the bottom clearance next and if suppose here we have the cg of the shackle plate so through one of the shackle plate half of the load would be passed that is wh by 2 because like this we have two shackle plates so this wh by 2 the load which is acting on the hook gets divided on both the sides of the shackle plate because as such we have two shackle plates on each side of the center line so when wh is acting wh by 2 taken up by one shackle plate wh by 2 taken up by the other shackle plate so that wh by 2 would be acting at the cg of the shackle plate and because of that this shackle plate would be pulled down that is when the load is acting on the hook this same load wh acted upon the shackle plate would try to pull the shackle plate in the downward direction so it means that the shackle plate will fail due to tension and therefore and where is the critical section of the shackle plate that i'll explain because since shackle plate is a plate with holes so 
this hole which is there at the bottom that is the diameter of the trunnion is lesser in size compared to the diameter of xl so where more material is removed then the stress would be concentrated in that part it means here the area would be minimum and compared to the trunnion here the diameter is lesser so less material is removed hence we can say that the critical section where the shackle plate will fail due to tension is this i'll call this section as section m m we can give it any other notation as well so therefore the area resisting tension for the shackle plate will be so here we have the width of the shackle plate at the center there will be the diameter of this axle shaft then we have the thickness of the shackle plate which is s so this is the failing area because when it would be failing across this section we turn and see the shackle plate it will look something like this so therefore the area is ws minus d suffix a into s so therefore w suffix s is what we have to find out da is 80 mm and the thickness s is 20 so this would be in terms of mm square and therefore the tensile stress would be equal to load which is wh by 2 acting on per shackle plate divided by the area load upon area and area is we know it is w suffix s minus 80 into 20 so now i am going to assume the material of the shackle plate same as the material of the trunnion same as the material of the axle shaft that is c45 for which the tensile stress we know it is 120 newton per mm square wh value is known to us it is 14.4 into 10 raised to 3 into 10 newton so once we know all the values we can get the answer of the width of the shackle plate and it comes out to be 110 mm so we have found out the width of the shackle plate next after the shackle plate has been designed that is the width has been calculated now i'll find the center to center distance so therefore so the center to center distance is given by c suffix s is equal to i'll explain this formula so this is the formula of center to center distance now here we need to know this distance which is c suffix s now how this distance is made up of that i'll explain starting with the center of the axle shaft from here up to we can say the center of the wire this much distance is the radius of the rope sheave because rope sheave is having diameter capital d so the radius becomes d by 2 so we have d by 2 plus small h small h is the depth of the groove which we have over here so that is small h the depth of the groove from where we will be subtracting the rope radius because rope will go inside so we have to find the remaining height so it will be h minus d w by 2 where h is the groove depth we have already seen the groove depth at the same time d w is 29 mm the diameter of wire now plus gap between rope sheave and nut cover now this nut would be covered with the help of a cover so the distance between the nut cover and where the rope sheave ends there is some clearance left so that distance would be there next there would be nut cover thickness the thickness of the nut cover which is covering the nut so thickness of that portion plus gap between the nut and the nut cover there will be clearance between nut and nut cover and at last the nut thickness nut thickness and this is the height of the nut and then the thickness of we can say capital h which is the thickness of the bearing or the thrust bearing 
so just putting the values one by one capital d it was the diameter of rope sheaf 667 mm plus small h is the groove depth that groove depth we have seen while designing the rope sheaf the groove depth was 55 mm and we can check it from psg 9.10 so you all can refer PSG 9.10 for the groove depth. Already we have seen this. An H value was 55 mm minus the radius of the wire rope. Diameter is 29. So half of that. Now gap between the rope sheaf and the nut cover. It is taken as 10 mm assumption plus the nut cover thickness. It is taken as 5 mm. The gap between the nut and the nut cover, it is also taken as 10 mm plus the nut thickness. Nut thickness is taken as 0 0.8 times the nominal diameter. And we know the nominal diameter was 68 for the threaded portion of the hook. So therefore, nut thickness would be 0 0.8 into 68 mm plus capital H which is the height of the thrust bearing kept on the cross piece and that height the dimension was 40 mm so from this the center to center distance comes out to be and also here one addition I am making in this formula plus H we have to also add if we see the diagram closely then center distance is also made up of that is where this height of bearing ends there is some portion left as we can see here and this portion is the thickness of the cross piece divided by 2 and this thickness of the cross piece is nothing but capital T we have already found out the value so next is plus H and we have to even add half of the cross piece thickness in this formula so that completes the formula we have to add the cross piece thickness so plus capital T value it came out to be 56 mm so 56 divided by 2 so therefore the center to center distance is 521.4 mm and at last the height of the shuttle blade the height of the shuttle blade denoted by h suffix s formula can be developed on the spot so therefore height of the shackle plate is made up of first of all center to center distance center to center distance plus the radius of the axle shaft or the hole of the axle shaft so it is cs plus half of ba plus at the bottom we have the radius of the trunion shaft or the hole provided for the trunion so that is dt by 2 plus at the top we have 1.5 dA at the bottom 1.5 dt that completes the height so dA value is 80 mm dt value is 50 mm so we can put the respective values and get the answer so therefore the total height of the shackle plate comes out to be s suffix s is equal to 781.4 mm so we have reached a stage where we have designed the tunian, the cross piece and even the shackle plate. Now we are moving into the last part of the design that is I can say that step number one. The complete snatch block part has been completed. The next part is we are going to design the rope drum. I will just give a quick idea that is what we are designing now. Now up to this stage we had designed the rope and the complete snatch block consisting of the axle shaft, the rope sheaf, hook, the bearing of the hook, then the trunion as well as the shackle plate and even the cover plate. So this part is over. Now we are going to design this traversing mechanism which consists of the rope drum. So we have to find out first of all how much would be the power of the motor and the RPM which the motor is offering 
then we have to even find out that which kind of gearbox arrangement we are going to use because obviously the rpm or the speed of the motor will be higher but the speed which is required over here is less we have calculated this speed uh, while we were calculating for the rope shift this speed came out to be 9.54 rpm so same would be the rpm of the drum because this rope will go into a drum the arrangement is somewhat like this that these ropes are passing to the drum in this fashion that is there are two sets of ropes which are passing on this rope drum so we need to know the dimensions of the rope drum and as i had explained we have to find the kind of gearbox the kind of power which we are going to transmit so the next part would be the traversing mechanism so that will be our step number second so we'll be design designing the traversing mechanism and in that the first step is the design of rope drum so for the design of rope drum we have to refer PSG 9.2 so on PSG 9.2 here is the cross section of the rope drum we can see that grooves are provided on the rope drum over which the ropes would be bound and at the same time we can see that this section is hollow having inner diameter di w is the wall thickness of the rope drum s is the pitch distance of the rope l is the length of the rope drum d is the diameter which is called as a drum diameter df is the flange diameter because this the shaft of the rope drum would be connected to the gearbox shaft that is the output of the gearbox would be connected to this shaft of the drum so we have the flange diameter as well because the flange of the gearbox shaft would be connected to the flange of the drum shaft we can say the complete drum so we have df the diameter of flange as well and now here i am going to take the diameter of rope sheaf same as the diameter of rope drum the reason being there will be no speed reduction or increase in speed between the rope drum and the rope sheaf the reason being at whatever speed the rope drum is rotated at the same speed the rope sheaf will rotate like for example in this case we know that the rpm of the rope sheaf is 9.54 rpm that is the speed of the rope sheaf so similarly that will also be the speed of this rope drum so when the speed is same the diameter will also remain same so hence we are getting the same diameter which is 667 mm in terms of centimeter 66.7 capital n is the speed in rpm revolutions per minute of rope sheaf is equal to the speed in rpm of rope drum so therefore capital n is equal to 9.54 rpm after this i'll find the groove proportions for the drum and for the groove proportions we have to refer psg 9.9 so on psg 9.9 here we have the groove proportions so first is the standard groove other is the deep groove if nothing is mentioned always go for the standard groove here we can see s1 is the pitch distance that is the distance between the center line of the rope or even we can say the center line of the groove d is the diameter of the rope then c1 we can see it is the groove depth so we need to fix these dimensions for that r1 first of all i'll say that whatever we require that is r1 then the pitch distance s1 and then the groove depth c1 so from this same psg 9.9 at the top it is written dimensions of drum grooves for wire ropes for that we have to see the rope diameter example first it is 4.8 mm so this is up to 4.8 next up to 6.6 6.2 similarly the diameter of rope which we have it is 29 mm so 34.5 is the exact value 
so it is up to 34.5 it means it it can take the diameter of 29 as well so the dimensions are for standard group r1 s1 and c1 19 38 and 10 next after deciding the groove proportions it is better to draw the diagram of the standard groove as well side by side so this is s1 the pitch distance the groove depth c1 and the radius of the rope which is r1 this is the rope cross section and here is the standard groove so it is always better to draw this diagram along with the proportions now after that i'll again refer psg 9.2 for the remaining dimensions so therefore so from psg 9.2 here i'll find w small w is called as the wall thickness that is the thickness of the rope drum and for that also we can refer psg 9.3 here is the formula wall thickness w is equal to 0.02 capital d where capital d is the diameter of the rope drum plus it is 0.6 to 0.21 cm we have to add in that so better take the average so therefore the formula becomes plus the average value of 0.6 and 1 that is 0.8 cm this formula would be there on psg 9.3 so therefore putting the respective value of capital d in centimeter it is 66.7 so therefore the value of w comes out to be 2.134 cm so that is the thickness of the rope drum next again from psg 9.3 d suffix f is the flange diameter the diameter of flange we can see on psg 9.2 as well so that is d plus 6 into small d where capital d is the diameter of the uh, rope drum small d is the diameter of the rope so therefore after getting the wall thickness capital d suffix f is equal to capital d plus 6 into small d capital d is 66.7 plus 6 into small d value it was 29 mm so 2.9 cm so therefore the diameter of flange comes out to be 84.1 cm if you want we can even put the value in mm that will also be correct next for the inside diameter of the rope drum from psg 9.2 since the inside diameter of rope drum the formula is given here on psg 9.2 in the rope drums part we have the formula of number of turns on the drum for one rope that is capital z is equal to h into i upon pi d plus 2 so by using this formula first we'll get the value of z because z will indicate the number of grooves which are present on this drum and we have to assume that the number of turns on the drum for one rope and we can see that the ropes would be there on both the sides so that is therefore inside diameter of the rope drum is given by first of all for inside diameter i'll explain it is simply calculated as the rope drum diameter that is the pitch diameter minus the twice the wall thickness that is by simple geometry because d is known to us from that if we subtract di or we can say from d if we subtract twice the wall thickness we are going to get di that is the simple calculation so it comes out to be 66.7 minus 2 into wall thickness which is 2.134 so from this i am getting the inside diameter and the answer is 62.43 cm
then after getting the inside diameter i need to know the number of turns so on psg 9.2 we have the formula of this number of turns on the drum for one rope so simply it means that how much grooves we should have on one side of the drum and here we have two rope system because in our case row a rope would be there on one side similarly on the other side both the ropes would be passing onto the rope sheep so we have to use this formula of z which will indicate the number of grooves or number of turns on one side it is hi upon pi d where h is the hoisting height in terms of meter it is given the hoisting height is 10 meter in this problem at the same time i indicates it is called as the mechanical advantage d is the diameter of the drum so i'll explain in a step by step manner that therefore z is the hoisting height which is 10 meter given into i is the mechanical advantage and previously also i had explained this while calculating the peripheral velocity i is the mechanical advantage and roughly or simply you can take it as half into the number of falls and we have seen in step 1 that it is a four fall system so i value comes out to be 2 now this height which is in terms of meter i'll place it in terms of centimeter so it will become 1000 cm and the diameter d is 66.7 so from this the number of turns come out to be 11.54 on one side of the rope drum so these are the number of turns or the number of grooves which need to be provided on the drum shaft on one side similarly on the other side same number of turns then the length of the rope drum from the same psg reference that is psg 9.2 the formula is given for this complete length of drum we have the first formula that is for one rope and the second formula for two ropes we'll go for the second formula because we have the two rope system so i'll write this complete formula it is 2h into i upon pi d plus 12 into s plus l1 for the two rope system we know the value of h and even i is known to us capital d s and l1 l1 is specified here on psg 9.3 it is the distance between the grooves of two rope pulleys so the distance between the grooves of two rope pulleys it is taken as the distance small a plus 2.5 cm so it means previously where i have drawn the groove dimension or the groove proportions so the distance between the two grooves is denoted as small a and this small a is taken equal to it is the width of the rope sheave at its tip so that comes out to be we already have the value of a where we have selected the rope sheave it was on psg 9.10 we can check this this is the height a or the distance a on psg 9.10 so for our dimensions we got a value is 90 so therefore l1 will be equal to a plus 2.5 cm this has to be assumed empirically so therefore a is 90 mm so it becomes 9 cm plus 2.5 and comes out to be 11.5 cm so putting all values over here capital l is equal to 2 into h is 1000 cm into i which is 2 divided by pi into d plus 12 into s s s value it is nothing but s1 because this s is the pitch distance so this is s1 so here we have s1 it is specified 
in PSG as well. On page nine point three, it is written S is the pitch of the grooves on the drum. So that is S one for us, and it was thirty eight mm. So that becomes three point eight centimeter plus L one, which is eleven point five. So on calculating this, I am getting the length of the rope drum as one twenty nine point six four mm. Six four centimeter, not mm, because all the values are in terms of centimeter. So the length of the rope drum has been decided. Next, in order to check the rope drum for the various stresses, here I have to assume some values. So I I'll write down an important hint here. so when we are checking the rope drum we have to assume that the rope drums are made up of grey cathine and that is as per the indian standard for which the tensile stress is taken as 230 kg f per cm2 shear stress is half of tensile so it is 115 kg f per cm2 and the crushing or compressive stress is 1000 kg f per cm2 so these values you all need to remember in order to check the rope drum for various kinds of failure now starting with the first one so in order to check the drum the rope drum for various kinds of stresses on psg 9.3 we have the formula of maximum bending stress as we can see here sigma b is equal to 8 into fr ld upon d raised to 4 minus di raised to 4 into pi so that is the formula to check the maximum bending stress for the rope drum sigma b is equal to so that is the formula for checking the bending stress in this formula we have all the values even fr value fr. now radial load which would be acting on the rope drum that radial load is taken as we have previously seen this radial load while selecting the axle shaft bearing so that radial load was twice of f f is the load acting on a single fall so for a two rope system the radial load was 6630 kg f so therefore this value of fr i am going to put it over here so just putting all the values in a step by step manner all the values are known to us so on calculating this i am getting the bending stress value as 31.74 kgf per cm2 and now this value is less than the permissible value because whatever is there the value for the tensile stress same we have to take for the bending stress as well so the value is 230 and on calculating this so 230 is the permissible value whereas 31.74 is a calculated value so calculated value is less than the permissible value hence we can say that the rope drum is safe under bending next after bending failure that is after checking the bending stresses now i'll write an important note here that suppose if it fails in bending then here we can see the formula of sigma b it is inversely proportional to di that is the inner diameter so if it is failing in bending sigma b is inversely proportional to di that is if i can explain it in a better way like this if di value is less that is if i decrease di value then this denominator will go on increasing because from d a less value would be subtracted and if the denominator increases the numerator will decrease and ultimately sigma b will decrease so i can say that inner diameter is equal to d minus 
twice of W the wall thickness. So the basic method is to increase the wall thickness. So if wall thickness increases, the inner diameter decreases. And if this inner diameter will go on decreasing, then it is being subtracted as we see here from capital D. So if DI decreases, this entire answer would increase and if that answer increases sigma b value will go on reducing so if it fails in bending then in simply increase the wall thickness then again from the same psg reference from psg 9.3 now we are going to check the drum for torsional shear stress so torsional shear stress denoted as tau the formula is on PSG 9.3 it is 16 m suffix t into d upon pi capital D raised to 4 minus di raised to 4 I will write this formula I will explain m suffix t on this side that m suffix t is basically and here also for m suffix t simply on PSG 9.3 we can look at the at the formula for torque on the drum in kg of centimeter it is fr into d min d min is nothing but the diameter of the rope drum plus small d which is the wire or rope diameter divided by 2 so simply this is the torque formula which is force into radius so therefore i can say that from psg 9.3 the torque which is acting on the rope drum is the radial load into the radius which is the mean radius so putting the respective values fr 6630 into the diameter capital D 66.7 wire or rope diameter 2.9 divided by 2 so therefore n suffix t value it comes out to be 230.72 into 10 raised to 3 Newton mm. Next, all values are there with us. So, just putting the values in the equation of tau. Therefore, tau comes out to be 17.04 kgf per centimeter square, and it can be seen that it is very much less than the permissible value, which is 115 kgf per centimeter square so we can say that therefore rope drum is safe under torsional shear then i'll check the drum for crushing again from the same psg reference the crushing or compressive stress is given as fr upon w into s So, this rope drum, since it carries the ropes and already the load is of huge amount, so there will be friction between the rope and the rope drum because of which there will be even though on some of the members like for example on the hook, there is tensile stress, there is bending, but on this portion where the rope and the rope drum are rubbing, there will be local compression and that local compression is called as crushing. So the crushing stress formula I had already written, we know all the values over here, fr is 6630, w is the wall thickness, 2.134 s is the pitch distance, 3.8 cm. So therefore, the crushing stress value will come out to be 817.59 kgf per cm square. And now this value also is way much less, it is less than sigma CR permissible which is 1000 kgf per centimeter square. So I can say that therefore rope drum is safe under crushing. And here an important hint that if suppose 
if it is failing under crushing then we can go on PSG 9.9 .9 and instead of standard groove select the deep groove kind of structure next after that we can even check for the normal stress and the combined equivalent stress the formula is given over here so therefore since the total normal stress on the same PSG reference 9.3 sigma v square plus sigma cr square sigma b value which we have got so i am going to put those values sigma b is the tensile stress it was 31.74 plus sigma cr is 817.59 so from this the normal stress value comes out to be 818.19 kgf per centimeter square and after normal stress from the same PSG reference also the combined equivalent stress will be given by the formula sigma suffix e is equal to root of sigma n whole square plus 4 into tau square so putting the values which we have sigma n is 818.19 plus 4 into tau value 17.04 so therefore on calculating this the combined equivalent stress will come out to be 818.9 kgf per centimeter square and we have to compare it with the crushing stress which is permissible equal to 1000 so therefore it is safe in the combined stress as well so and that is we are comparing it with the crushing stress the reason being according to the maximum normal or principal stress theory so here we have completely checked the drum now after checking the drum the next part which remains is we have to find the diameter of the drum shaft and the drum shaft bearing so the next part is the design of so on PSG 9.2 we can see that this drum shaft which is there at the center this drum shaft is having a particular diameter that diameter we need to calculate at the same time it is supported in bearings so we need to know the type of bearing as well so that is the next part of the calculation now for that I would be requiring the length of shaft because as we see here I can explain the concept over here itself when FR is acting over here in that case here the length of shaft would be the length of the drum plus 15 15 mm on both sides that is the clearance which I am going to take and since FR is acting it can be treated as a simply supported beam with point load at the center so here there would be reactions on both the sides and those reactions would be half of FR so FR by 2 on one side FR by 2 on the other side and because of that since here there are supports there won't be bending over here bending moment is zero the maximum bending will occur at the center so therefore once we have understood this concept so the rope drum or the rope drum shaft is simply supported beam with point load at the center FR is the load which is acting exactly at the center it gets divided equally on both the reactions so on both the supports it is divided now for simply supported beam with point load at the center the maximum bending moment is given by m is equal to w into l by 4 l is the length of shaft I will describe here that since l will be the length of shaft denoted by small l in terms of centimeter so therefore it is made up of capital L which is the length of the rope drum plus 
15 15 mm uh, we can say it will be 15 15 centimeter on both the sides so 15 centimeter plus 15 centimeter clearance capital l value is known to us it was 129.64 so on adding up these values the length of shaft comes out to be 159.64 centimeter so we can see that capital L is the length of the rope drum plus 15 15 centimeter on both sides that is the length of the shaft so hence putting all values over here so therefore the maximum bending moment will come out to be 264.6 into 10 raised to 3 kgf centimeter so that is the maximum bending moment also previously we had seen that the drum shaft will also transmit because since the drum is rotating and the drum is rotated by the drum shaft so they are transferring the same torque so it means that the shaft is rotating that is it is transferring the torque of m suffix t the maximum torque at the same time it is subjected to bending so this is a case of combined twisting and bending so therefore For combined twisting and bending, the equivalent torque is given by root of, now therefore equivalent twisting moment is given by, so T equivalent is equal to root of KB, K suffix B is called as shock and fatigue factor for bending taken as 2 into M is the maximum bending moment plus k suffix t is called as shock and fatigue factor for twisting taken as 1.5 into t now t is the amount of torque which is being transmitted and for us it is nothing but this m suffix t value it is the amount of torque which is transmitted so it is 230.72 10 raised to 3 <coughs> but here we have to remember that m is in terms of kgf centimeter so even t value should be in terms of kgf centimeter so i'll show the conversion in order to convert it into kgf divide by 10 and since here we have 1 mm so again we have to divide by 10 so therefore this value would be 230.72 divided by 100 that is into 10 kgf centimeter because if we want to convert it into Newton mm again we can check it multiply by 10 and again multiplied by 10 so that becomes 10 raised to 3 Newton mm so this is the value of torque and simply it would be 2300.72 kgf centimeter so therefore the equivalent torque value comes out to be see here already there is in actual no need of conversion because uh, FR value was in terms of KGF, I'll explain it over here. Capital D and small d both were in terms of centimeter. So the answer which we got already it is in terms of KGF centimeter. So no need of converting it. So therefore, this is 230.72 10 raised to 3. This is already in terms of KGF centimeter and this is the whole square. So the value is it is 632.32 into 10 raised to 3 kgf centimeter now selecting the material for the drum shaft that since the shaft is subjected to huge torque therefore selecting alloy steel as the material alloy steel as the material for shaft and the alloy steel which i am going to select here it is 40 cr1 MO28 consisting of chromium and molybdenum and for that the reference is from PSG 1.14 and PSG 1.17 we can get the value of stresses so from PSG 1.14 it is this material at the top 40 CR1 MO28 for that here we need the yield strength 
and take the maximum value of yield strength corresponding to the tensile strength between 100 to 115. So taking the value as 80 kgf per mm square and the percentage elongation is 13. So therefore sigma yt is 80 kgf per mm square multiplying this by 10 it gives me the answer as 800 newton per mm square this is corresponding to 13 percent elongation and therefore assuming factor of safety as 3 for repeated loading so therefore permissible tensile stress will be equal to sigma yt divided by FOS so sigma t permissible comes out to be 266.67 Newton per mm square and therefore the permissible shear stress because that is what required here it will be permissible tensile divided by 2 so 266.67 divided by 2 it is 133.34 Newton per mm square and considering the effect of keyway because shaft will have keyway with which it would be connected tau is taken as 0.75 of the current value so therefore the new tau permissible considering keyway effect is it is 100 Newton per mm square so therefore the equivalent torque equation is given by 5 by 16 the diameter of drum shaft cube into the tau permissible value and this shaft is for the drum that is the equation and therefore I will go on putting the values equivalent torque was 632.32 into 10 raised to 3 tau permissible is 100 so from this I am getting the diameter of drum shaft and remember one thing since we are keeping the stress in the form of Newton per mm square even T equivalent should be in the form of Newton mm so to convert it from kgf centimeter to Newton mm directly multiply with 100 so it will be 63.23 into 10 raised to 6 Newton millimeter so this value of torque needs to be put over here so I'll say that in this value I am multiplying with 100 and so the value which should be used is 63.23 into 10 raised to 6 because stress is in terms of Newton per mm square so even the left side should be balanced instead of kgf centimeter we should use Newton mm so therefore the final answer is it is 147.67 mm so that's the diameter of the drum shaft now no need to round off this value we'll round it off later once the bearing is selected so the next part is let's select the bearing for the drum shaft since on one side of the drum shaft the load which is acting since i'll say that is the radial load is equal to fr by 2 where fr is 6630 kgf so therefore the radial load will be equal to 3315 kgf or 33.15 into 10 raised to 3 newton or 33.15 kilo newton now comparing this value with the limiting value which is of 8 kilo newton so here the radial load is greater than or it should be equal to 8 kN but since here this is greater than 8 kN which is 33.15 so therefore we have to select roller bearing and not ball bearing because that is the condition if the value would have been less than 8 kN we would have gone for ball bearing but since it is greater we go for roller bearing and therefore there is a tendency of the shaft to tilt a little bit as well and here I'll give an important hint 
since the shaft is rotating at the same speed as the rope sheaf or the axle shaft over which the rope sheaf is there so therefore life in hours life in millions of revolutions and l10 value will be same as that of bearing for rope sheaf because the speed is also same so that's why there is no need to calculate life in hours millions of revolutions and l10 again for the drum shaft so directly we can go for the equivalent load so therefore from psg 4.2 again the equivalent load formula which we have seen in number of times it is equal to x into v into fr plus y into fa into s into k suffix t so i am directly putting the values over here explaining them one by one x value is 1 that is the radial factor v is for inner or outer race rotation like we have seen for rope sheaf it was outer race rotation so v value was 1.2 here the drum shaft is rotating first and the drum is rotating, rotating afterwards so v is taken as 1 this is for inner race rotation and in case of rope sheaf we have seen outer race rotation then fr is the radial load which is 33.15 into 10 raised to 3 newton we can put in terms of kilo newton or kgf then also it is fine here actual load is 0 so this factor becomes 0 y is the thrust factor it also goes away because there is no actual load on the drum shaft s the service factor taken as 1.3 and k suffix t is the temperature factor taken as 1 if nothing is specified about the temperature so the equivalent load on calculating this comes out to be 43.095 into 10 raised to 3 newton or it is 43.095 kilo newton now once the equivalent load is known so therefore using the formula which is c is equal to l10 raised to 1 by k into the equivalent load that is also from the same reference PSG 4.2 and now L10 value was previously for the rope sheaf 5.724 millions of revolutions 1 upon k k value is to be taken as 10 by 3 for roller bearing for wall bearing it is 3 and the equivalent load it is 43.095 into 10 raised to 3 newton so therefore on calculating this here i'll write down that k is equal to 10 by 3 for roller bearing so therefore c which is the dynamic capacity of the bearing comes out to be 72.73 into 10 raised to 3 newton or dividing by 10 7273.39 kgf so that is the dynamic capacity now after this therefore from psg 4.32 now i am selecting the bearing number so from psg 4.32 we are going to select the spherical roller bearing because as explained when the drum shaft would be there in the bearing there are chances of the drum shaft to tilt a little bit or the drum to tilt little bit so we have to select spherical roller bearing and in that we have seen that the diameter of shaft answer it came out to be 147.67 mm so taking this as the reference here small d indicates the inner diameter of bearing or outer diameter of shaft small d is 147 and it is close to this value which is 150 mm so selecting the bearing number it is of triple two series triple two three zero c so therefore the diameter of shaft now rounds off to 150 mm so from psg 4.32 selecting bearing number triple two three zero c for which now the diameter of shaft for the rope drum will round off to 150 mm depending on the bearing number and the dynamic capacity c 
is of this bearing is it is 64,000 as we can see here the dynamic capacity is 64,000 kgf so we can clearly see that the dynamic capacity on calculation comes out to be 7273.39 and for the bearing which we have selected it is 64,000 kgf so therefore the bearing can take up this much amount of load it is very much safe so we can say that the bearing is okay the selection is perfect now after this moving on to the last part of this step that is the motor selection that is once we have finalized the dimensions of the shaft the drum the next part is we have to select the rpm of the motor and then we'll comment on the type of transmission so after that since from psg 9.7 we have the formula of power on psg 9.7 we have this formula of power which is in terms of hp horsepower q into v where q is the weight or load to be lifted this eta is efficiency which is made up of efficiency of p which is efficiency of pulley efficiency of drum and efficiency of gear and p indicates the number of pairs of gears into 4500 will give me the power in terms of hp so therefore from psg 9.7 the horsepower of the motor is q into v upon efficiency into 4500 now this q value is the load which is carried by the drum and the drum carries the load which is to be lifted or we can say also the load of the snatch block which we have calculated in step number one while designing the rope so q is made up of it is the total load carried by the rope in terms of kgf and the load which is carried by the rope consists of the load which is given in the problem it was 12 tons so 12 into 10 raised to 3 kgf plus the weight of the snatch block snatch block is taken as 5 percent that is 0 0.5 of the total load so this is the load which is carried by the rope and already it has been explained in step number one so the answer of q will come out to be 12600 kgf next v is the velocity with which the load is lifted so that is given in the problem it is 10 meter per minute and this if nothing is given about the efficiency always take it as 80 percent or in decimal form it is 0 0.8 so putting all values over here so therefore it comes out to be 35 hp so that is the power of the motor now converting it into watts so 1 HP is 735.5 watts. So therefore, now the power will be 35 into 735.5 watts, 25.74 into 10 raised to 3 watts. Therefore, it comes out to be 25.74 kilowatts after dividing with 1000. Now therefore, selecting the standard motor that is from psg 5.124 so on psg 5.124 at the top we have foot mounted three phase induction motors and out of that when we see the first column there is kw rating that is the power in terms of kilowatts our value is 25.74 so when i look into this column the last value is 22 kilo newton so apart from that we don't have any other value so it means i'll write the statement here since the mo motor power which we have it is not a standard motor so therefore using a custom made motor so the motor would be custom made it would be customized according to the requirement because it is not there in the standard form so therefore now the power would be rounded off to 26 kilowatts so we'll have a motor of 26 kilowatts and usually we have three speeds that is 960 rpm 
1440 rpm and 2880 rpm now we have to select any one value it is better to select low rpm for this application because higher rpms are used for those machines like for example centrifugal pumps where the high speed operation is required but here in this case we are seeing that in order to drive the rope sheave the rope sheave is being operated at 9.54 rpm so if we are selecting a very high value of speed then to reach this speed of 9.54 rpm we would require huge amount of speed reduction it means the size of gearbox and the number of gears are going to increase so that is why we are selecting low speed because low speed selection will result in compact size of gearbox that is the reason we are selecting a low speed because to reach from 960 rpm to 9.54 rpm the number of stages required would be less and if we go on increasing the speed similarly the gearbox size will increase so it is better to have less speed of the motor in order to get a compact size of the gear we are going to have a custom made motor of power 26 kilowatts and speed of 960 rpm and but one of the disadvantage of selecting a low rpm motor is that the cost of the motor would be high so that is just on the disadvantage side now at last i am going to show the transmission system that is we have to comment on the transmission system it was given in the problem so for that so now to comment on the transmission system first is since overall reduction of the gearbox that is the overall reduction which we want to achieve it is given by the ratio of input speed upon the output speed then just now we have seen that input speed is the speed of the motor which is 960 rpm from that the out, output speed which we want is 9.54 so therefore the overall reduction would be 100.628 it means we want a reduction of this value so this reduction would be done in steps and how to decide those steps for that also here i am giving the condition that we have to go for single stage if the reduction ratio is less than 5 we have to go for two stage gearbox if the reduction ratio is less than 25 and we have to go for three stage gearbox if the reduction ratio is less than 125 it means to which of these ratios the value is closer now when we see this overall gear ratio it is closer to 125 means since the value is less than 125 so therefore we will use three stage gearbox so i'll say that after this in the comment on the transmission system we can comment that therefore we will use a three stage gearbox and for that three stage gearbox i'll explain the setup three stage will have four shafts now a gear on shaft number 1 and first i'll explain that shaft number 1 is connected with the help of coupling to the motor which we had designed so motor with the help of coupling will drive this shaft 1 which is at a speed of 960 rpm now this shaft carries a gear which would be comparatively small in size called as a pinion and then that gear will mesh with another gear which is comparatively larger in size to get the speed reduction so on shaft 1 the gear is smaller in size called as the pinion on shaft 2 it is comparatively larger called as the gear or wheel so there is speed reduction from stage we can say shaft 1 to shaft 2 so this is one stage this is the first stage then 
on shaft 2 we are going to have a compound gear arrangement that is there will be another gear on shaft 2 smaller in size compared to the first gear on shaft 2nd and both the gears would be rotating with the same speed because they are onto the same shaft then another gear would be connected comparatively bigger in size on shaft 3 so that we again get a speed reduction over here so this is the second stage of the gearbox then on this shaft 3 another small gear would be connected called as the pinion and both the gears on shaft 3 would be rotating at same speed and such kind of arrangement where on one shaft we have more than one gear it is called as compound gearing arrangement so this is these are the compound gears and at last finally a bigger gear would be connected to this pinion on shaft 3 and this gear is on shaft 4 and it will be carried forward connected with the help of coupling again to the drum shaft so this is the third stage and here all the gears are fixed on the shaft that is these are not splined gears these are fixed at their locations so these are the three stages and we have seen it consists of four shafts and finally what will happen is from the motor when the speed is 960 rpm it would be transferred to shaft 1 rotating at 960 rpm then to shaft 2 the speed would be reduced by how much amount we can find it by the stage ratio not required right now for this problem we can see this in the problem of gearbox then again the speed reduces up to shaft 3 and finally when it reaches shaft 4 the speed has become our requirement which is 9.54 rpm and this is being coupled with the sh drum shaft we can see here this is the drum shaft already the design we have seen so the drum shaft will also be rotated with 9.54 rpm and with the help of these ropes the rope shape would be rotating with the same rpm so in short that was the comment on the transmission system and here we complete the design of the EOT crane so in the end here we have seen the design of the complete EOT crane consisting of the design of the snatch block and the traversing mechanism I try to make it, it as simple as possible by dividing it into number of easy steps. At the end, if you'll find my videos helpful, you'll can like, share, comment and subscribe our channel and share it amongst your family and friends. Thanks for watching.